Uh, we'll call to order tonight's Committee of the Whole for the Auburn City Council meeting for October the 18th, 2022. The City Council should have the minutes from the October 4th Committee of the Whole. Are there any additions or corrections? If not, is there a move to approve? So moved. So I have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion carries. Questions on for the uh, City Manager related to tonight's agenda? Any questions from the Council? Okay. No, but I do, Mayor, if I may ask um, the city manager a couple of questions in response to some constituent emails that I received this week regarding the um, construction of some billboards on North Donahue. Um, I know that the city is not able to um, stop things that happen in the county, um, but could you give a little bit of overview of that so that the stakeholders and constituents understand kind of the position that the city's in and know that we are, um, well, I personally am frustrated with our lack of ability to do things and that we're, we're trying to find some creative ways to get around. <laughs> Absolutely. This has been an ongoing issue on North Donahue um, and other places in the city. Um, our zoning ordinance in general doesn't allow signs of a certain size. Uh, but when a parcel is not in the city limits um, and people, we don't have a welcome to Auburn sign, you're entering, you're leaving, or we would have, you know, 25 of them on Donahue, not really, probably about 10 or 15. Uh, we don't do that at the edges of our city limits, but that happens. And so anywhere property is is owned that is in the county and not yet in the city limits. Um, the city has no legal authority to forcibly annex property. Um, this is a property rights state. Uh, the only way that can be done is by uh, legislation. With the legislature, we have not requested any such thing um, on North Donahue, but we have no ability to regulate those things, even if they're county islands in between two parcels in the city limits. The county itself has very limited zoning and they only have it in an area in which um, a particular beat voted zoning in, and it's a very specific case. Um, in this area, in this beat of the county, it'd be difficult because there's a lot of city limits around it, and I'm not saying that's not something the council might not want to pursue, but um, I respect the frustration of the citizens that live in that area. They feel like they have invested much in their homes and they weren't expecting extremely large signs to line a major arterial in the Auburn city limits. Um, and, and they're very frustrated. They're on both sides of the road. Well, one side and now the other side is, is gaining. The western side is gaining more as we speak. Um, and we will continue to look at ways in which we could try to work with property owners or others to not do that. Um, there's also one on North College just before you get to Shig Jordan Parkway that was very controversial. And it's a tiny sliver of property that was not in the city limits, everything else. And I mean tiny around it. And so I respect the frustration and I know people would like for us to do something about it, but legislatively we are limited in any authority of the city to act accordingly because the property is not under our jurisdiction. Thank you. And I just um, would like our constituent, my constituents to know, especially on North Donahue and in Ward 3, that um, it's very disheartening to know that we have property owners who don't um, understand and, and really take for, um, take to heart what it means to be, to do um, the right thing in Auburn. And so we'll be having some pretty hard conversations with those property owners um, to encourage them to do better about Auburn and to do better on North Donahue. So look for more of that um, in the future. Thank Good. you. Yeah, thank you. City Manager, is there anything for us really to the tonight's? No, no changes to the agenda. Um, you, there are three council members absent this evening. Um, and I was aware that all three would be absent, but you're fine from a quorum standpoint. Yeah, good. All right. Anything else from the council? Is there a move to adjourn the Committee of the Whole? That moved. The Committee of the Whole is adjourned. We'll get started with the regular agenda in just a second. We'll call to order tonight's Auburn City Council meeting for October the 18th, 2022. With the roll call, Lindsay. Dawson. Here. Dixon. Griswold. Hovey. Parsons. Here. Stevens. Here. Taylor. Here. 
Mitten. Here. Anders. Here. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and then remain standing for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. During the Committee of the Whole, there was no um, definitive council actions. We did have a short discussion about billboards on North Donahue Drive. Under Mayor's announcements tonight, I uh, want to remind everybody before we meet again on November the 1st will be Halloween on October the 31st. That's on a Monday night, and please be mindful of the children trick-or-treating, maybe possibly within your neighborhoods, and understand that downtown trick-or-treat will be going on again, and so downtown will be closed off late in the afternoon, and uh, we look forward to having the children and their families in downtown Auburn that night. This weekend, the city of Auburn is proud to host the Big Ten Mayor's Quarterly Meeting. We have never hosted that meeting before, and so the mayors of the 10 largest cities in Alabama will be in Auburn on Sunday and Monday uh, having meetings. We are very blessed to go and spend some time with the president of Auburn University at dinner at his house on Sunday night, and we look forward to having all these mayors here in our community this weekend. Also this weekend on Sunday, there are two different events I would encourage you to participate in if you have some time and uh, believe in these organizations. There's, there'll be a walk for Alzheimer's and a walk for Down syndrome, and all that information can be found on the internet, but great, two great causes, and I encourage you to participate. Today we had a very special opportunity to open up the new um, Auburn University Healthcare and Education Clinic that is located at the Boykin Community Center. This was the culmination of many years of planning, um, a vision that came from the city council and our city leadership um, many years ago, and the partnership with the university um, made played a perfect role in making this happen. The College of Pharmacy, the Harrison School of Pharmacy, has really played a lead role, but you've got uh, students and departments that are participating from nursing and uh, the College of Education, the College of Liberal Arts, and, um, and VCOM. And so today this clinic was opened uh, in the Boykin Community Center. Now at the Boykin Community Center, you'll have child care, you'll have after school care, there's senior care, and um, there's also um, the food pantry is located within Boykin, and now you've the pharmacy-led um, health care clinic. Uh, this is going to allow our citizens that are underinsured or uninsured to have a location where they can go and get some basic primary health care. It'll be critical to the needs of Northwest Auburn, and I'm just very thankful to all the departments uh, that made this happen from a city perspective. The city... Uh, Spent a lot of money building out the the the, um, the office space in there, and um, it looks excellent. And uh, it was a great time today to celebrate something that will be very very positive for our community. The city of Auburn has done a number of things to support the Northwest Auburn neighborhood over the years, and this is. Uh, another great uh, example of that partnership and I certainly want to thank Auburn University when we talk about town and gown this will be another box that we can check that we have done something positive for our community community so I encourage all of you uh, if you have a moment and going to be in the Boykin area to go by and check that out um, also going on right now is the Beat Bama Food Drive, and this ends on November the 17th. So uh, there's a number of grocery stores in town that you can go by and collect food and drop that off at those grocery stores. Uh, I believe there's some other avenues for you to participate. Uh, I don't know how we'll do in the football game uh, on Thanksgiving weekend, but we can defend our title uh, winning the Beat Bama Food Drive, and I appreciate all of you considering uh, participating on some level. We changed the date of the State of the City address, which was uh, going to be next week, but we had a scheduling conflict with a very, very important event on campus, and so that event has been moved to November the 16th. Uh, I hope all of you will take an hour of your time that day and, and come to the Gooch Performing Arts Center and hear about the great things that have been done in the city of Auburn and what are our goals and challenges as we move forward into the future. Also that time, I'll be recognizing six citizens with the Mayor's Lamplighter Award. These are six citizens that are quietly going about doing a great job making Auburn a special and unique place, and I hope that you'll take time to come be a part of that. Tonight, and uh, we will, during the consent agenda, we will um, hopefully prove a tax abatement. We're very excited about a new company that will become an Auburn Korea Fuel Tech America. 
they are making a sizable investment um, of about $10 million in hiring 90 new employees, and we welcome them to Auburn and are very proud to have them here in our community. Also tonight, we have a special guest, Mr., and I'm going to try to pronounce his name right, Mr. Timo Kluth. Uh, works with RAPA here locally, and he is in town uh, doing some training here with our local RAPA plant. Uh, Mr. Kluth is from Selb, Germany, and he is actually on their city council in Selb, Germany, which is called, uh, I think it's, he's a part of a party, which is called the Active Citizens. So that certainly should resonate with many of you here in Auburn. But we're, if he's here right now, would you raise your hand, Mr. Kluth, if you're here? We're glad to have you. Thank you for being here in Auburn. Thank you for what you do. Uh, look forward to talking to you after this is over with tonight. Um, yesterday, the Auburn Housing Authority hosted Operation Community, uh, which was uh, a partnership between the Housing Authority, the residents of Ridgecrest, and our public safety, particularly our police. Uh, it was a great afternoon of fun and games and music, and uh, I appreciate everybody's efforts to bring all of those people together. Uh, last week, I was uh, also invited over to the Eagles um, headquarters on campus where they had an employee employment awareness seminar. Um, again, this is another great group who are, the Eagles is, uh, as many of you know, is providing an educational opportunity for students with special needs at Auburn University, availing that great Auburn experience to everyone who would like to be a part of that, and I, I was grateful to be over there. Also last Saturday was the Harvest Market, um, which is the fall version of our uh, farmers markets that we have during the summertime and thank you Becky to you and your staff it was a great day beautiful weather out there on a beautiful fall Saturday and finally uh, I just want to as just a point of uh, information uh, part of my responsibility is to appoint uh, members of the Auburn Housing Authority and uh, tonight or I, recently I have reappointed Miss Deborah Hand to the Auburn Housing Authority she represents uh, the residents of the Moton um, in the Ridgecrest Housing Authority um, location. So I was proud to reappoint Ms. Hand. Ms. Sharon Talbert, who is the president of the Auburn Housing Authority, uh, recommended re the reappointment of Ms. Hand. And that is all I have for mayor's announcements tonight. I know that's a lot. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to say? I, I just want to say that uh, I also want to commend the people uh, that took part in the health uh, center that's at Boykin. I was able to be part of that uh, river cutting ceremony today and tour the building, and it is a very beautiful facilities. And uh, I would like for everyone, um, especially those who need it, to uh, take advantage of it. Uh, it's, it's there, and it's for people who, you know, it's, it's local, and you can walk. You have residents that can walk to the facilities. So I, I, I just want to encourage everyone to come out and just tour the building, see how nice it is. They have a, uh, exam rooms. I was surprised to see some of the things that was, um, I didn't vision it at first, but now once I saw it, then I, hey, it hit me just where it needed to hit me at. And so I, I just want to, um, I just want to thank those who took part in it. And uh, I also want to also thank those past council members that sit here and they made it also happen along with the present um, council members. So um, just just come out, look at it, uh, take advantage of it, and I'm, I'm just ready, I'm ready for it to roll. <laughs> it's rolling now, we're very excited about it. Thank it's you, Connie, now, it, was right. good to, it was good to have you what there. What is the today. hours, can you say, can you tell the hours, please? I do not know off the top of my head, we'll have to check. Uh, there's definitely, and I don't know if Mr. Al Davis, he may know. Is he here? They're working through. I think it's important. There's a full-time medical doctor there, and then this project was underway um, well before COVID and was pretty much nearing completion at the time COVID hit, um, and it kind of slowed down um, operations there in terms of how things were going with the university. And one of the big things was recruiting a full-time or at least a four day a week medical doctor to be at the clinic. So we're very excited and grateful to Auburn University for this wonderful partnership. And the, the goal is to serve the community. And as the land grant school in the state, it, its main mission is outreach. And I'm really excited to be able to take advantage of some of the outreach from our largest and biggest employer um, and biggest economic engine right here in Auburn. All right, anyone else on the council have an announcement? I have one. Yes, ma'am. If I may. Um, this is a little bit early, but I want to put it on um, everyone's calendar. I will be hosting a Ward 3 stakeholder meeting on November the 7th at the Cary Creek Clubhouse. 
My guest will be Dr. Kristen Herring, the superintendent of Auburn City Schools, and she will be talking about the second high school that is slated to come into Ward 3 in 2027. Okay. And that will be at 530 November 7th. Okay. Anyone else? Mayor, if I may, you sure, uh, touched briefly on Halloween safety tips. I would encourage each and every one of our citizens to go on our social media pages and look at the uh, tips for Vicky and Safe that the Public Safety Department puts out every year. And uh, particularly this year, pay particular attention to what your kids are being given. Uh, if it's not wrapped properly or not con uh, sealed from the, uh, I would be very careful about what I'd allow them to uh, partake in. And uh, the, the Public Safety Department does a great job every year of putting out the tips that we need to. And unfortunately, we, it's the world we live in nowadays. We have to uh, keep an extra eye out of what, what our children are doing and uh, just to hope nothing like that would ever occur in Auburn, but just to be safe, please keep him, keep that in mind as you enjoy the trick-or-treating. Thank you, Chief. Good reminder. Okay. All right, we'll move forward with Auburn University Communications. Hello everyone, Hello. pretty short report from me this week. So first thing, Hay Day is tomorrow. For those of you that don't know what Hay Day is, uh, this is a special Auburn tradition that began in 1947 when Auburn SGA wanted to welcome student veterans of World War II back to campus with name tags to make them feel seen and included. We are still carrying this out today. Um, now this looks like a lot of events on campus all day long and still handing out those name tags. So um, we do encourage you to come participate on campus if you have time. Um, if not, then we encourage you to honor the spirit of Hay Day by just being <coughs> kind to strangers and uh, making everyone feel welcome in the community. So we're excited to kick that off tomorrow. Um, next, uh, Rowdy Gaines, Auburn alum, three-time Olympic gold uh, medalist, uh, often referred to as Swimming's Greatest Ambassador, um, will be honored by the College of Human Sciences at their International Quality of Life Awards on December 5th. This is given to individuals who have made an outstanding and immeasurable impact on both their local communities as well as even globally. Um, so we're very excited that they considered an Auburn alum part of that group um, and thankful for everything that Rowdy Gaines has done for the community as well. And then lastly, the SEC SGA presidents all came together recently to pledge their own personal money um, to help fund hurricane relief in the affected areas. Um, our own president, uh, Jake Haston, was part of that initiative and we're very proud and thankful that the SEC schools were able to collaborate in such a meaningful way. Um, but that's all for me this week, War Eagle. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you very much. Okay, this time is an uh, opportunity for you as citizens to comment on items on tonight's agenda. Uh, I would say to you that there are a couple of items that I know a number of folks here would like to speak to us on. Um, those items will have public hearings attached to those. If you'll look in your agenda, you'll see public hearings, and we'd ask that you save your comments for those public hearings, okay? But if there's anything else on the consent agenda or the uh, first three ordinances that you would like to speak to the City Council regarding, then now would be the time for you to come forward. Ordinance uh, 9A, it's not, doesn't have a public hearing, does it? Okay. It does not. So I want to make sure I couldn't, no, see, you're it, good. couldn't you're see good. it on there. I'm getting old. So my name is Robert Wilkins, 261 uh, Denson Drive, Auburn, Alabama. <clears throat> I did want to talk about Ordinance uh, 9A, uh, dealing with the um, little business license and so forth. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm concerned a little bit about it, I've, I've read it, and it seems to be pretty wide open. Uh, it seems to be where... Um, it, it deals with every license, and uh, I, I feel like that maybe somehow there's the reason this was brought up was there must be a couple of uh, things that are uh, uh, not benefiting the city, and maybe that should be more specific instead of so broad. Because I've learned from being broad with the uh, Ordinance 3288 that uh, if you're not in a certain area, everyone's cut out. So I don't want that to happen with the business section. I, and the reason I'm concerned is uh, also I've, I've been a business owner since uh, I was 11 years old. Started off with uh, three cows and a bull that my dad gave me. And I've done everything from recycling tires to financial market to internet, computer filters, used car operation. And I've dealt with the federal, the, the state, the county, and the city regulations before. I've also dealt with territory. I lived in the Virgin Islands and was part of a, 
uh, two businesses that we had there. So I understand how regulations are important, but also regulations can, can really hinder the growth. It can really strangle the growth of a business, especially a small entrepreneur type situation of you know five or eight or 10 people. So uh, I, I feel like it's very important. Uh, I'm not sure why it's so immediate. I, I know you're not gonna vote on it today, I don't believe, are you? You're just putting it up, is that correct? No, it's on the agenda right now. Okay. To okay. be considered, yes. Okay, but then the next meeting it will be. I really believe this should be something that uh, should be done uh, when the new council comes in. I, I don't know why another uh, council meeting would be a problem. Uh, so that, because uh, business is the main income for the city, the revenue from that, and you're talking about affecting a lot of people. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Who'll be next? Okay. <clears throat> We'll move forward with uh, city manager communications. Hey, Mayor, good evening. Um, I'd like to announce one vacancy for an unexpired term on the Board of Education. Term begins upon appointment and ends May 31st, 2026. Yes, thank you, city manager. And if you don't mind, I'd like to interrupt. Um, last week, Dr. Terry Jenkins uh, submitted his resignation from the school board, uh, effective at the end of the year. Um, Dr. Jenkins has been a warrior for our children for many years. He served as our school superintendent and has served on the school board for one full term and a partial term. So the city council will be looking to replace Dr. Jenkins to re uh, fill his uh, partial term, which I believe Ms. Crouch is two years or three years? It, the term would end in 2026. Okay. All right. So he'd have to, so almost three years basically by the time we get to January. Um, and then possibly that whoever is uh, appointed could certainly uh, move forward to a full term at that point in time. Just to give some basics, and we'll firm this up here in the next, uh, hopefully by the end of the week, um, applications will go live sometime this week. Um, we'll close those applications on November the 21st, and then we'll hold interviews uh, for the finalists for that sometime between late November and about mid-December. The appointment date will be the second meeting in December, which is December the 19th, okay? So if you or if you know anybody that would be interested in the school board, it is, uh, it's, it's not an easy job. It's very time consuming. You have to make sometimes some very challenging decisions, but it's so worthwhile. Uh, these are the five leaders that help our superintendent run our city schools. Um, certainly go on to the, the city's website. Uh, there's an application there for you to fill out and we'll consider you. But we wanna thank Dr. Jenkins for everything he has done. And Mayor, I apologize. I gave you the wrong date of December 19th. It's December 20th. December 20th, excuse yes. me, okay. All right, thank you. Our meeting on December 20th, all right. Mayor, I'd also like to uh, commend Dr. Jenkins. Uh, when I used to, when I was, my previous career in law enforcement, he was always a good friend of law enforcement and, and it's something very rare sometimes in academia. He had a lot of common sense and that made him extra special to the, our community and, and the work he did for us. Good, thank you, Chief. You're exactly right. Okay. Mayor, our first item of business is the consent agenda. Does any council member wish to remove an item from the consent agenda and deal with that item individually? Yes, ma'am, I have some. 8D1. Okay. 8D2, 8D4, 8D7, 8D8. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, we'll start with 8D1. All right, item 8D1 authorizes a contract with Alabama Power Company for removal of above ground utilities and the installation of underground utilities in downtown Auburn, um, just behind the Hound and the city's loading dock. The contract amount is $146,119.37. Move for approval. Second. second. All right, have a motion and a second. Chief, turn it uh, over to you. It's just a, a good a large amount of money, at least to me anyway, and uh, I'd just like for you to touch on what exactly it's going to Yes, yeah, probably over the last 15 years, we've made an attempt to get the vast majority of the utilities in, in this area underground, and this is some of the last remaining above ground utilities. Um, we actually had a semi truck recently uh, <coughs> snap one of the lines that belonged to Charter Communications on a football Friday. Not that we didn't just have a lot of football Fridays, but one of the five. Um, and there's some low hanging lines in this vicinity, and while the public was not in danger, we had to shut the, that whole area down until we got 
the line off the truck and did some other things. Um, and so we're trying to get the overhead lines out of the way to also improve aesthetics in the area and reliability on power for the businesses in this area. And this is a project we've kicked down the road for the last 15 years. Um, and we're using some of our commercial development funds to do this so it's not impacting uh, the general fund directly as much as our, our commercial development funds that are allocated as part of the general fund. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions from the council? All right, we've got a motion to second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 8D2 authorizes the purchase of P25 simulcast radio tower equipment from Communications International Incorporated in the amount of $728,485.08. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. I'll turn it back over to you, Chief. It's just, again, uh, three-quarter of a, uh, a million dollars here. I'd just like to uh, touch on exactly what, what this is going to do for us and, and why we're you uh, Excellent. This is uh, definitely budgeted funds as part of our capital pro um, our capital improvement program. Um, this is adding a, a tower for communications in the southern part of the city off a of corporate parkway. I have a uh, deputy public safety director, Will Matthews, is here, and he could provide a little more information about what it's doing. Sure. Thank you. Uh, this is a uh, our second tower. The, the first tower sits here in the back parking lot. Uh, that's our original tower. Uh, the original plan uh, called for optimal coverage of the city to have three towers. Um, this is the next step, phase two, that'll cover, uh, give us better coverage around the industrial parks and the technology parks on the south end of town and the interstate going that direction. So, Director, this is a I know we've had a dead spot down there for law enforcement for a number of years. This will do away with a lot of that dead area where we can't get out. Yes, sir. It should cover that entire south end, um, which we have good coverage now, uh, but in some of the industrial buildings that, you know, um, have large infrastructure and equipment in it, we have some problems with building penetration there, and so this should remedy that problem. Uh, that's really what we're trying to tackle. Thank you, sir. That's very yes, sir. important for officer safety, and I, I really appreciate y'all studying that and getting it getting it before the council. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the council? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Item 8D4 authorizes a contract with Cutting Edge Lawn Service, LLC, for landscape maintenance on I-85 Interchange Exit 50 in the amount of $93,860. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Chief? I'd just like for Megan to touch on, I, I noticed the improvements down there. That, it was such a dark area and, and kind of drab looking, driving into Auburn. It's the first exit now coming from the south into Auburn. And uh, if you could just touch on what, the, what we're doing for that area. In that area, we've um, partnered with Alabama Power to light up Cox Road from South College all the way past the Bucky site um, to tie in. We have also invested um, with the state of Alabama in lighting for the interchange as uh, Chief Dawson is mentioning that area had no lighting. I don't think people realize when an interchange is constructed that lighting is not part of that. And it's our city engineer has long tried to put in the budget, and we've worked diligently with Alabama Department of Transportation to not only get this interchange lit, but we finally have some landscaping where this is a major gateway into Auburn, and we are excited to finally have it look as such. And now this is the follow-on maintenance contract. We do not have the staff capacity to maintain this interchange at the level of which it needs to be maintained without hiring it done. But we also hire a lot of our medians and other um, key areas of the city done by the private sector to balance that. Uh, won't there be red lights eventually down there? For yes, because of uh, Bucky's, there'll be two. So the northbound ramps, um, northbound headed toward Atlanta, will have a traffic signal there, and you will have a traffic signal at Bucky's Boulevard, um, where it meets with Corporate Parkway and Cox Road. There'll be uh, one at both areas. We've had a lot of questions about whether or not uh, Bucky's was uh, handling its fair share of infrastructure, and absolutely, they, they are funding all of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions from the council? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. All right. Now I believe we're on 8D7. Correct. Item 8D7 authorizes the execution of an annual contract with East Alabama Health Care Authority doing business as East Alabama EMS LLC for emergency response, rescue, and ambulance services in the amount of $376,518. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Chief? 
If you could just touch on what the money is, it's three hundred and some thousand dollars. Uh, to, what yeah, you this is an annual contract, basically for ambulance services in the city. Um, I can have Deputy Director Matthews go into a little more detail, but I think a lot of people uh, don't understand that Lee County and Opelika also partner with East Alabama Health for this service, and this is this is our annual contract. But Deputy Director Matthews. Yes, sir. Uh, this this is the annual ambulance service contract. It's uh, it's shared by all three government entities. Uh, the same amount. Uh, it it adjusts from year to year. We get quarterly reports from the uh, healthcare authority on their staffing and uh, other statistics of uh, performance. Um, and this covers uh, their service for emergency response with ambulance. Thank you. I know we purchased uh, trucks to do some of this stuff ourselves. How, how is that going? We have it in service yet, or it is not in service yet. I think the chief is here, so Chief Langford, if you could come up to the podium and just respond to that, just so we can hear you on the microphone, that'd be great. Good evening. How are you? Um, so we have purchased equipment, uh, personnel, or training getting ready to provide the service but it it will be several more months before we're assisting the hospital with emergency type medical calls well, we're excited about that and i want to tell you personally how what a great job your guys do and your, your ladies as well yeah. i've had to use them a couple times for my parents needing medical attention emergency and they were just i couldn't ask for anything any better and it makes you proud to be a citizen of auburn knowing we have that type of help coming when we need it Thank you. Thanks, Chief. I may have need yeah. to stay up here. Oh, no, you're good. <laughs> yeah, I might want to stand on the side for a minute. But I think just piggybacking on the rescue truck, I want to be very clear, as the Chief was, we're not in the ambulance business, but in the event Opelika has three such rescue trucks and sometimes incidents happen and this county is growing and is busy, uh, there are times that we might have a dire need to transport someone on our own, and this gives us the ability to do that. And that, that is our goal. We're also improving some of our heart monitor equipment and, and upgrading some of our training to provide even more services to people. Good. Okay. Any other questions? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 8D8 authorizes the purchase of one Pierce Tiller truck to be used by the fire department in the amount of $1,596,052. A few quick caveats. A tiller truck is a ladder truck with a driver on the back of it with a steering wheel. Um, a couple other things I just want you to be aware of. This is a prepayment. Um, we're saving $38,000 by prepaying this, but it's not budgeted until fiscal 24. And to make things more interesting in this current era, we will not see this truck for 32 months. Move it is replacing approval. a 20-year-old truck. So, okay. yeah. Move second. for approval. All right. Got a motion and second, Chief. Again, it was just the amount I wanted the public to know what we're getting, and, and it's just kind of hard for an old police officer to let fire get something to cost that much money without saying something. <laughs> <laughs> you could just, just tell us a little bit about what this thing will do. You need to know a little more about what it does? Just let the public know. All right, know Chief Langford, please, please approach the microphone. <laughs> for, for the one point, almost $6 million. Yes, there you go. The, uh, price tag is a bit shocking I will admit and it didn't slow down it we priced it maybe early in the spring and it was about 1.4 and five months later it's 1.6 so um, it's just I kind of as far as the price goes I see it as kind of like the automobile market it you basically paying sticker price for everything these days so um, unfortunately, that's the the cheaper of the models that we looked at. But um, this ladder truck will be 107 feet long. It'll provide. It is a articulating ladder, so uh, maneuverability will be much increased. Um, we can get around downtown much easier, and it should last 20 years. So that's its lifespan. So, you know allocated over all those years that so maybe it's not too painful for you to stomach well rumor has it the last time we had one councilman hovey was a student firefighter and he right. drove the tiller is that that's, correct that's true yes yeah. so chief Langford, we, we will be retiring 
a truck that we have currently? We Big will. Ones? Okay. Uh, 2002, 75 foot aerial. Okay. Good. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I know that uh, I want to thank the citizens of Auburn for uh, it's their money we're spending, but uh, it's, I know that they will get good use out of it. We have such a fine public safety department, and I, I guess I'll go ahead and say it. I've been very impressed with fire since I got on this other end of the uh, <laughs> spectrum. But uh, again, I just I just had to say something about it, uh, being an old policeman. No problem. All right. Any other comments on that? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And that carries. All right. Is there a motion to approve the rest of the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All right. Motion is second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the consent agenda is approved. Ordinances. Under ordinances this evening, item 9A amends Chapter 12 of City Code to add a provision that establishes a process for revocation of a business license and sets forth the circumstances under which a business license may be revoked. Unanimous consent is necessary. Um, I would like to deny unanimous consent. Okay. It's fine. I think we need it introduced. We need to, have an in Do we need to go through the motion. Right. I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. I'd like to deny unanimous consent. Okay. Ms. Krause, before we move on, um, just for, for us to understand and, and the audience to understand, the, these types of rules and procedures that, that we are potentially looking at uh, in two weeks now, um, there are other communities, other cities, particularly in our state and even nearby that have something that's very, very similar, correct? Absolutely. This came about pre-COVID. We were down a path um, with this. And the reason we are is, is there's never a goal to revoke anyone's business license. And as you heard earlier, businesses are very important. But we also have a lot of law-abiding businesses that are remitting their taxes in a timely manner or even paying penalties to do so. And we have some businesses that are, that are not. There's not a level playing field. Um, and there's a whole process of which has to be followed if we don't have this in place in which, in which we must follow to actually get money that was collected, um, tax money that was collected that is due to the city. Um, and so that's part of this a two-pronged process. There's also a criminal nature. There could be things going on um, that, that, that are going on through the business, not outside of the business, um, that has to be addressed. And previous councils have asked for such information. As a matter of fact, um, just the cities in Alabama that subscribe to Muni Code, which is something that uh, publishes city codes, there are 92 in the state of Alabama that have this exact provision written, including Opelika, Alexander City, Phoenix City, and nine of the 10 cities in the Big Ten, Birmingham, Mobile, Tuscaloosa, et cetera. Auburn is the only city in the Big Ten that does not have this exact provision in its business license ordinance. So, uh, and that's, you know, cities as small as Union Springs and Op have it, you know, Gadsden, Anniston, Oxford. I mean, we're, it, we're the exception, not the rule. And, and our neighbor, Opelika, has had this in effect since at least 2007. Sure. So unanimous consent has been denied. This will automatically appear at our next agenda on November the 1st. And this is an opportunity for our community to continue to speak to the city council. But I thought it was important for everybody in Auburn to understand where this came from and who else has provisions like this. And we'll consider this in two weeks. Absolutely. And the one other thing I'd like to say is anytime any of this is going on, there's a lengthy due process um, that goes on before any of this ever happens. And so I really, the reason that we're pursuing this is to have a, another tool in the toolbox. Um, but certainly in two weeks, we'll talk about it again. And we're happy to answer questions in the interim. Thank you. Can we put something out on social media where we can get encourage citizens to contact your office or to, that might have questions about this before we do it, just to head off? We don't normally put that on social media. We're happy to just say with agenda items in, in general, um, you know, we're happy to do that and, and post that there's a council agenda. I mean, we're happy to do those things. We don't usually get specific to an item. Um, but again, several people have engaged us already in conversation. There is some misunderstanding about this as to whether or not um, it, it says that a business license could be revoked over things that employees do. <laughs> Um, under the color of the license, and that's confused some people to think that that means if their employees are acting or breaking the law outside of the business, that they could be held liable, and that's not the case. 
Um, I also want to caution you, or you can Google it, is I don't, you know, in the local area, I don't know how often op Opelika has invoked this, but I don't recall a time that I've read an article in the newspaper about it. So I think it's an extremely rare circumstance that any city invokes this. It is just a tool um, in the toolbox if and when necessary. That's the point I was wanting to get out to the public, is it's not something that could just be done on a whim. It takes a lot of... Uh, yeah, no, sir, and that would not be the intention, and we are happy, and, and we will look at what we can do to talk about that. And we're always glad to have dialogue, uh, no matter what side of an issue people are on. This is, you know, it's a public process, and you're the governing body, and you'll make this decision, and, and not the staff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. You ready? Item yep, 9B please. establishes a no parking zone at 118 South Gay Street. Unanimous consent is necessary. I introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. We have a motion to second. Does anyone on the council have a problem moving forward with the vote on this this evening? Hearing none, is there any comments or questions from the council? Um, I do have a question. Um, I know this is a small area of spaces um, just south of um, Hamilton's on South Gay Street, right before you get to the um, new Publix um, parking lot. Is there any consideration for the parking spaces that are further north on South Gay that are in line with Hamilton's um, just to discourage any parking on that area of? That would actually be the preference of the staff. I did not allow that to proceed out of concerns that might be raised by the businesses. I thought um, what, what the issue is with parking spaces so close to the intersection or driveways is it blocks sight distance. And if you've ever been at the Magnolia and Gay intersection with cars trying to park there, people in the left turn lane, whatever, it's, it's, you've got a slow way down and it's a lot narrow. Uh, the staff would be happy at the pleasure of the council to bring that forward. Um, these two spaces, the reason these are coming forward is it is a sight distance from the driveway issue and was part of the traffic study at the time Publix was moving forward. And even though there are no striped parking spaces there now, people continue to think that they can park there. And so we cannot enforce no parking there until you actually say so. And it's odd that we amend Ordinance 1499 like 28 times a year to, to deal with this. But um, we're coming forward with more. This is the first of many to reinforce some areas that people seem to not be very clear on whether or not there are no parking. We're going to come back through to the council and make it clear. Okay. So we're happy to bring that forward. Uh, Council and again, this is all being done with safety in mind. This is so people can see to get out of the driveway so we don't have accidents. And we also, mind you, have a lot more pedestrians on the sidewalk than we once did. And the, the more sight distance you have in a vehicle, the, the less conflicts we will have. So it's, a, it's purely a safety issue. Okay. Any other comments or questions? All right. Lindsay with a roll call. Dawson? Yes, ma'am. Parsons? Yes. Evans? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Bitten? Yes. Anders? Yes. Item 9C1 is a request from Luke and Teresa Granke to annex approximately 21.94 acres of property located at 484 Lee Road 25, also known as Hillendale. The Planning Commission recommended denial of this request by a vote of 5 to 2 at its October 13th meeting. Unanimous consent is necessary. <laughs> I'll introduce the ordinance and ask unanimous consent. Second. I have a motion and a second. Anyone on the council have a problem moving forward with the vote on this this evening? All right, any comments or questions? I have a question, Mayor, if I may. Please. Uh, Crouch, is it this, it would be zone rural residential coming in, is that right? It would be zone rural, but it's outside the optimal boundary. It's one parcel below the city's optimal boundary. Explain to the public what this, uh, me too, for a matter of fact. What exactly that means? Well, one of, one of the good things, I'll explain what it means. We are going to have a workshop in January as we get the new council seated and their feet on the ground about growth boundary and, and other things in our optimal boundary. But we established many years ago an optimal boundary saying this is where we could provide services. This is where police, fire, water, sewer, all of these things. This is where anywhere inside this area we would recommend annexing property. Outside of it would be un only under careful consideration of the council. Um, we do a lot of infrastructure and growth planning, much more than people uh, think we do, and we're always happy to talk about it. And so that is why staff recommended denial of this. It is just one parcel below, and one of the questions the council members always have for me is, well, if we take this parcel, does it move the boundary? And technically, we have moved the boundary every time we annex a parcel outside the growth boundary, and it shifts then further south or further west or 
what have you. And those are one, one of the things we're going to be discussing with the council in January is here's where this is and here's what our policy has been um, to give you a better lens into to what we're doing moving forward. Um, but certainly this would be zoned rural if it is brought in and the applicant is not requesting anything but rural zoning at this time. There has been no request otherwise. Uh, Planning Director Steve Foote, correct? Okay. So this is right at 22 acres. If we were to approve this, the, out, the owner would have to come back before this body and get it, get it approved if you want to subdivide or anything like that. Yes, they would. One of the things I need to remind the council of also is um, an ordinance is a permanent operation of the city, which requires a majority of the elected body. So there are only six of you here. It takes five affirmative votes to pass any ordinance, period, whereas resolution is a simple majority. As it stands, I know there's a lot of the gro growth out there and development in that particular area, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if it's not annexed in, it could anything could go in on it. That's correct. Thank you, ma'am. As we were dealing with not saying the applicant has nothing to do with this, but yeah, they can put billboards there. You can put a right. junkyard. You could do, and they they've never stated any intent. I'm just saying, when there's no zoning authority, anything can be done. Thank you, Miss mm -hmm. Crouch. What is the what is the standard policy of, of the evaluation of the optimal boundary? How often do we do that, and is that something that we'll be looking at in the near future? Mr. Foote. Well, in 2023, we're going to initiate the comp plan update, and so I would certainly think that that would be something we could look at at the same time. That's normally when we do is when we do comprehensive plan updates, and this all coincides with giving the council a review of all of all that we're doing for all of this and what goes into it as we embark on that process. I would just like to say this again, make sure I got it right. This is just taking in 22 acres of rural area. And for anything else to be to go on out there, it had to be approved once again by the city council. It would have to be a, for anything other than that the rural zoning does allow, you know, farming operations. It allows three acre lots. It allows, a, a variety of, of things that's correct but any zoning change has to come back to this body through the planning commission to you thank you ma'am mm -hmm. yeah. any other comments or questions okay Lindsay with the roll call Parsons no Stevens no Taylor no Whitten? no Dawson yes ma'am Andrew no so the annexation was not approved. Item 9C2 is a request from Gonzalez Strength and Associates Incorporated to annex approximately 4.33 acres of property located along Lee Road 12, Cox Road. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its October 13th meeting. Unanimous consent is necessary. I'll introduce the ordinance and ask unanimous consent. Second. I have a motion to second. Does anyone on the council have a problem moving forward on the vote on this this evening? Seeing and hearing none, any comments or questions? Lindsay? Parsons? Yes. 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 Whitten? Yes. Dawson? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Item 9D authorizes zoning ordinance text amendments regarding murals um, to Article 2 definitions, Section 203, and Article 6 signs, Section 602 definitions, and Section 604 prohibited signs. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval at its September 8th meeting. Unanimous consent is necessary and a public hearing is required. I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. I have a motion to second. Does anyone on the council have a problem moving forward with the vote on this this evening? Seeing or hearing none, we'll open the public hearing. If you'd like to address the city council, please come forward and give your name and address for the record. Hey, uh, so I'm Luke Granke, uh, 484 Lee Road 25. Do you want to talk about the murals, Luke? Do what? So right now we're on item. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I, 9D. Um, I thought we were going over what we just discussed. No, we've, we've closed that. Okay, no yeah. problem. No problem. No problem. Yep. You, you can speak at the end, can yeah. you? Yeah, okay, if I'm you'd sorry. like to wait to the end of the meeting, correct. All right, does anyone like to speak about this item? Okay. We'll close the public hearing again. And uh, any comments or questions from the council? Um, I would just like to say um, that I think 
that over the course of the last um, six, eight months that the study group uh, met several times and um, I'm proud of the recommendations and the product that's in front of us in the ordinance and that the planning commission did unanimously um, recommend approval um, to the council. And I just think this is a great step in um, creating additional community and um, providing an avenue for art in our area. Thank you, Ms. Witten. Anyone else? Um, I appreciate everybody's work on this and uh, appreciate Mr. Parsons and Ms. Witten, their leadership and the members of our planning commission. Uh, I plan to support this, but I will tell you that I hope our community does the right thing. Um, this is not a time to be political. Um, this is a time to, I hope, that your vision for what you would want to have on the side of your building is something that um, elevates our community as a whole and uh, that we'll all be proud of and that people will not find offensive. I hope the right will make the right decisions for the right reasons and do things that we're proud of and that folks will be getting their, can't wait to have their photos made next to as they visit and come to our community. So I challenge our community to please um, do the right thing. I am very excited about some of the cool things that we could receive through this. All right. Any other comments? Okay. Lindsay, with the roll call? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Whitten? Yes. Dawson? No, ma'am. Parsons? Yes. Andrew. Yes. All right. Resolutions. Item 10A1 is a request from Brett Basquin of the Foresight Group for conditional use approval of an institutional use of church for property located in the 1200 block of North College Street in the Development District Housing and Comprehensive Development District Zones. This project is known as the North College Street Church. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval at its October 13th meeting. A public hearing is required. Move for approval. Second. Second? Yeah. All right, we have a motion a second. This time I'll open the public hearing. If you'd like to address City Council, please come forward and give us your name and address for the record. Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. Any comments or questions from the Council? Um, I do have a, I know this is a conditional use request, but as we move forward, if this is approved, will there be um, um, deacceleration lanes that go into the property and how will traffic be um, maintained um, at peak hours of the church operation hours? One more time about the peak hour piece. Uh, like how will they maintain the traffic coming into North College at the... So generally speaking, we would not, you know, uh, churches have a different peak hour than a good bit of the rest of the city and we've been working handily with everyone um, to address that. Uh, one of the things that is in our current engineering standards, and I, we have our engineering division manager, Brian Wood, is here tonight. To He will assist me if I get off the rails with this one. But um, turn lanes, left and right turn lanes, um, in plain English, are required on arterial roads for projects such as this. So we used to have a criteria where they had to warrant, and now they are absolutely required unless they are waived by either the city engineer or the planning commission. And that is the case here. Um, I believe they would have a little less than a thousand parishioners could attend at once at this facility. And um, like everyone, we, we work together to try to do this. The, chath the Catholic Church exits and enters um, for different masses at times. And um, we do work with everyone to try to keep people safe, but we are also mindful of the public that has to. This is a major arterial, and some people may not be attending services at, at, at either church in this location and be needing to get through the area. So they also end up working with our public safety team and our city engineering group about what they can and can't do in the public right of way to manage that. So a center lane for left and right turns, or will there be actual um, deacceleration or both? So they would have a right turn deceleration lane okay. into it. I don't know that an acceleration lane out of it, a right one, would be required. Would there be a center turn lane, Brian, or will there be a just a dedicated left? Do we know yet? Well, a left turn lane would be required. Yeah. Would be the center turn lane. Okay. Yeah. And they would be responsible for those improvements? Absolutely, which means often the width of the road, depending on the, the pavement itself, has to, to widen out to fit those in, and that, that is on them and on their dime. The only time we get involved is if we needed to extend it further to help a neighborhood or somebody else also get a turn lane sometimes, then the city funds the extra that we ask for. Thank you. Right. 
Any other comments or questions? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Item 10A2 is a request from the City of Auburn for conditional use approval of a public service use, a community recreation center, covered swimming pool, athletic fields, and a public park for property located north of 737 Ogletree Road in the Rural Zoning District. The project is known as the Lake Wilmore Community Center. Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval at its October 13th meeting. A public hearing is required. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion second. Before we open the public hearing, I'd like to ask the City Manager um, Ms. Crouch, there was a number of, of images that you and your staff put together uh, to share with the council and share with our audience and obviously those that are watching with us here tonight. Can you can you pull those up and let's Absolutely. work through those? Look, this was, uh, we I watched the Planning Commission meeting last week and there was a lot of questions and what we'd like to do now is try to clear up some of those questions before we get started with the public hearing. I think a, a couple of things. This is the master plan uh, for the Lake Wilmore property. Um, and sorry, a pointer is not going to work where everybody can see it. But in the <laughs> southern end is Ogletree Road. And you can see in the far right of the drawing um, on the southern side, the Ogletree Elementary School, it exists. And our fire station is, is outlined there. This was the overall master plan done as part of the Parks and Recreation Cultural Master Planning process that completed in 2018. At that time, uh, this Parks and Recreation Advisory Board in concert with the City Council decided on a first phase of projects and the one of the projects recommended as an outcome of that study to be done in the first phase was the Lake Wilmore Community Center. Um, this property was acquired from the Waterworks Board of the City of Auburn in 2004. Um, at the bottom of your drawing you see 208 acres and that is a massive piece of property that includes some acreage to the far north and so on. Uh, the mainstay of the parcel we're talking about is in the 180 acre range and so it was decided that the city had no facilities on this side of the interstate. While there is Chihuahua State Park and we had a softball complex and we had no park facilities and one of our highest demands at the time was not only um, basketball in a community center in general it was for outdoor swimming pool because we have lost our pool at, at Drake um, school and we only have the Sanford pool so it was opted that we would proceed mainly with a community center that had an indoor walking track um, a two full-size courts or four short courts in, in Megan terminology um, some parking and possibly pickleball and some other things um, we had capital plan to do this project and it is the project area we're looking at you can't see numbers very well is in the upper right corner and it was numbers four and five and parking lot associated with 15 and a and six a swimming pool um, and what happened moving forward we went through and designed this and then COVID hit we were getting ready to go out to the bid in spring of 20 and this conditional use was already approved in February of 2020 and not only did we put this project on hold for financial reasons, we completely pulled it out of the capital improvement plan. Um, we only did that to balance the budget, not because we didn't intend to build this, but it was a necessary thing to balance the budget. So this next drawing I'm showing you is outlining in purple what we're proposing to do right now. That is the only piece that's overlaid over the original master plan. Um, the, the thing that we added in the summer of 22 is four multi-purpose fields or multi-sport fields. Um, the Parks and Rec Advisory Board came back with strong recommendations to complete the Lake Wilmore project. Um, one, because of the great need for basketball. We have plenty of statistics about the number of teams that are playing, and it's actually an overwhelming number of teams, a lot of which are not only underserved by our facilities, they're having to trim their practice times to 45 minutes from an hour because of lack of facilities. We have high school kids playing basketball at 930 at night. That's when their games start on school nights. We have a lot of challenges because we're underserved in a growing community. So um, we were solving some of those needs. And at the same time, we have football, lacrosse, and even though we're adding to the soccer complex, that is a much needed outdoor sport and field space sport. And we also have baseball and softball teams who need somewhere to practice. So the decision was I had asked the staff of all the city property that we have, which is mainly Richland Park space that is yet to be developed adjacent to the Yarbrough Tennis Center. We have uh, this space at Lake Wilmore Park that was already slated and you can see on the master plan for baseball fields and we move and multi-purpose fields and we move them up the multi-purpose fields um, we also have what we know is Society Hill Park which is down by the Lazy Bee that we have no infrastructure at 
The city engineer evaluated all the sites and said none of them are excellent properties from a cost perspective. They all have topography. They have what many things um, that are challenging. But at the end of the day, of the property we own and have inventory where we can deliver fields the fastest and most cost effective is at the Lake Wilmore property. So uh, the community center itself is a $22 million project. We added a $16 million turf field project to it, and the council reviewed that over the summertime as part of the budgeting process, and it was put in the biennial budget. Um, to give you um, a better look of side by side, and excuse my bad InDesign skills, um, meshing these together, but the top is what was proposed, the bottom is what we're building now, in purple just a little bit of a, a top bottom comparison there. And then to give you a, a good look at the Lake Wilmore property, there's been some environmental concerns. As you can see, what looks like, is that a gigantic creek? It's not a gigantic creek, but that's floodplain outlined in blue. Um, and you're, you're talking about total disturbance of this or the, the gray areas around the multipurpose fields and community center. You're talking about 34 acres of disturbance of over a 200 acre site. Um, there's a line going down the middle of the property and you see red lines, squiggly lines below that. Those are some bike trails that will have some light disturbance because of this project, but we can restore access to. And if you're looking on the left side of that property, those fields are taking up minimal acreage. We will leave 121 acres just west of the um, natural gas pipeline. Um, we will leave that undisturbed. And we've had some concerns from citizens about, well, you're taking green space away um, you're taking walking trails away. 121 acres to me is a lot of property um, to still provide plenty of recreational opportunities for a variety of people. I can tell you when I assumed this role um, a little over two years ago, two and a half years ago, or sorry, one and a half years ago, it feels like two and a half years ago. Um, <laughs> when I assumed this role, one of the biggest challenges put before me was the Parks and Recreation and Cultural Master Plan. And for a growing community, uh, we got behind and COVID delayed us. We had a good plan, and COVID delayed us. And I would love nothing more to, than to acquire a lot of property all over the city to do this. There is nowhere else to do this. It's Richland Park, or it's here. We have infrastructure here. We have existing road network. Um, we have an area of town that doesn't have a lot of facilities, and this is the place that we can do this. I can give you overwhelming statistics about our youth participation from volleyball you know, to lacrosse again and, and other sports. But... Uh, the reason for here is this is property we own and control since 2004 that we've always planned to put facilities on. Um, just a few other things just to give you. Um, these are planning commission drawings. I'll do the zoom in, a, a better look at these fields. Again, the, these can play um, tackle football. They can play flag football, soccer, lacrosse, and baseball and softball can get their practice on there all they want. These are not competition fields for baseball and softball. They will be lit. Um, we are using specialized lighting that, that points down, and we're very cognizant of we have some residents within six or 700 feet of this area, just, just kind of due south, and a lot of them are closer to 1,000 feet. Um, we're using specialized lighting to make sure that we do not impact them you know, from a direct lighting standpoint. But yes, you will see ambient light in the air as you look in the distance. Um, we are not connecting Kentwood Drive into the into the Winway Road or Grove Hill subdivision area at this time. We are grading the land for it, but we have no intention of connecting it in this initial phase as we told the adjoining property owners we would not. Um, that does mean that everybody that wants to access this park will have to go to Ogletree Road and into the park and enter that way in their vehicle. If they're on foot or on their bicycle, they can enter from Kentwood Drive. So uh, this is the general layout. I believe, and Becky or Brian, correct me, I think we could have a maximum of about 700 cars park out here in the spaces we plan to provide. We have done a traffic study. Um, the only time our traffic gets really egregious from here, because we shouldn't be entering and exiting at the same time the schools are, is if all 700 cars, if we had football going on on all fields, all those games ended at once, we had two or four basketball games in at once. We had a swim meet in the swimming pool and people were playing pickleball and then running their dogs around and all 700 people wanted to leave at once, we would have a problem then. Uh, but normal flow um, will be normal flow. Yes, sir, Brian. Just a quick correction on that. It's about 350 parking spaces. When we look at our traffic analysis, it's the turnover. It's the turnover that's causing the 700. Okay, thank you. 
I appreciate that. The city engineer told me 700, and that's my city manager brain, so thank you. Megan, you, the first slide you showed was the original plan that came from mm -hmm. the cultural plan uh, four years ago. Talk about what are plans versus realities in developing a park like this and its usage. Well, one of the important things in this entire document is this is a master plan. This is our, our, our best guess at what we, we could put here. In reality, when we go to final design, topographic issues, um, things like the floodplain grows, or the floodplain has grown on this property in the, in the latest studies, which, which may limit some things that you can do. Um, we also have, if you look off of Oak Knoll Circle down in the lower left, there's a, there's a number, I think it is, I don't have my glasses on at the moment, it's um, 18 is I think what it is, yep, or 13. Um, 13 was multi-purpose fields that we have moved up. We have no intention of building the baseball fields here um, that are shown on the original master plan. The multi-purpose fields uh, have been moved north and further away from existing homes. There's also some parking lots labeled as number 15 and 16. Uh, we're currently not planning to have anything to do with that. I do think number two that is shown as disc golf, which is up between the, the creek looking blue areas about in the middle of the drawing. At some point we could do disc golf, but people will have to, will have to build a little footbridge or something from an existing parking area to get to it. But it is very normal for plans to change. This is what, what could be not not full reality. And the only thing we're asking for approval for tonight from a planning perspective are the four multi-purpose fields and the community center. And again, the community center was approved previously in, in 2020. And what has happened since 2020 is the Parks and Rec Advisory Board has come back to the city and said, in their estimation, what they believe is that we need these multi-purpose fields. So we're reapproving, looking at reapproving the community center uh, as we did in 2020, but now mm -hmm. we're adding, potentially adding these four multi-purpose fields. Yeah, and I mean, just to give you a, a, a flavor even for basketball, our current youth league um, registration for winter 2022, which is not final, is 794 players in 80 teams. And for high school age league, 240 players in 24 teams dealing with the existing gymnasiums we have. And that is why practice time has been cut, and that's why – why we've got to move forward and, and get a center on the ground. In the uh, outdoor sports, you have a, a lot more going on. Um, and I, I guess I also neglected, let me jump to the pool real quick. Um, because of the loss of Health Plus Fitness and the Drake Pool, you know, this council's heard a lot from people, our swimming community, that wanted a city-owned facility where they're not commuting elsewhere to swim. And we have changed this pool from just an outdoor pool to a covered pool that is heated that will allow um, year-round use. I can't say when it's 22 degrees outside that everybody's gonna wanna be in the indoor swimming pool. Still might be a little cold, but it will be heated and so on. Um, on our multi-purpose fields though, just to give you a quick idea, in spring 2022, 99 teams used fields. That's a mix of soccer and lacrosse, plus 87 baseball and softball teams needed space. In the fall of 2022, 137 teams are using fields, soccer, lacrosse, tackle, and flag football, plus 49 in baseball and softball teams need access to fields throughout the city for play. All right, so the intent here is just is to inform everybody and let them know where these ideas came from, how we got to this point, what was the thought process uh, that led us here this evening. So at this time, I'm going to open the public hearing. If you'd like to address the city council, please come forward and give us your name and address to, for the record. Brian O'Neill, 1509 Dartmouth Drive. Um, as a longtime resident of Auburn, having grown up here um, playing baseball at Felton Little Park and basketball at Frank Brown, um, and then as an adult, having the opportunity and the uh, amazing honor of coaching basketball, soccer, football, and, uh, and baseball. Um, this is near and dear to my heart, and that was one of the reasons why nearly two years ago I sought appointment to the Parks and Rec Advisory Board because too often there were conversations at the ball fields, at the basketball courts, that in, in my opinion as a, a resident was embarrassing, that we were woefully behind in the facility development for our young adults knowing that athletics is not always the destination, but it's an avenue for leadership development, for personal growth, and um, for physical fitness. Um, 
the uh, the conversations got to my heart to the point where um, I was honored to be asked and, and stepped into that role and was a part of this planning process. And the city manager did a great job of explaining the process and the conversations that we had. And there's a lot of people here today that have been you know advocates for these facilities. And we all know that nine years ago, funds were reallocated towards the school systems away from parks and recreation. And we're trying to mitigate that and then grow into where we've seen 45 plus percent population growth we are woefully behind in meeting the needs of our children. And I totally understand and have watched the, uh, the, the, the commission meeting from last week, the desire as, a, as an Eagle Scout, I understand conservation and the desire to have green space and natural wooded area, but with growth comes give and take. And as we had conversations with the different sports and their advocacy groups, you know, we talked about you know, who needs what, and we made some hard decisions, but the plan that you see before you meets the needs of multiple sports in these multi-purpose fields. It meets the needs of volleyball and basketball and senior walking um, in the, the indoor facility. And so I, I hope that this council takes to heart the fact that when we say there's four basketball teams practicing on a middle school basketball court, that's 40 kids on you know, roughly you know, 500 square feet, that's not acceptable in Auburn, Alabama. And when we have kids playing baseball in a parking lot of our high school football stadium and taking balls flying all over the place, we're better than that. And, uh, and so I want to, to, to today come before you and, and let you know that, you know, this process, we relied on the 2030 comp plan. We re relied on the parks and rec master plan. We looked at all the options and this is the best option to take that next step. So as you consider this, not only am I recommending approval for the Lake Wilmore project as it's presented today, but I ask each of you that sit in these chairs that we need you to continue to advocate and find the money for future facilities, for future land, um, because our children deserve better than what they have today. Thank you. Thank you. Who would be next? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Very good job. Uh, Chad Key, 1006 Serenity Circle, <coughs> Auburn, Alabama. Um, I moved here eight years ago with my wife and my family, and um, I'm pretty much going to echo Brian's um, sentiments. I, I serve on the Park and Rec board from a football aspect. Now, the reason that I was asked to, to participate is um, I played higher level football in the, in the Southeastern Conference, along with one of my friends, Rob Pate, uh, played here at Auburn University, also serves on the board, and uh, unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. He's doing a continuing education class. Um, it's pretty much, I, I feel like I just, um, I was asked to speak probably two or three years ago, four years ago, um, and then finally, I'm, I'm doing a favor for a couple of friends in that I was just told last week that there was a lot of pushback on something of this nature. And it was just like, um, so I'm, I'm basically wanting to speak um, on behalf of, I would say the average parent uh, that's trying to uh, raise their children here in Auburn. The same reason that we moved here eight years ago um, because we wanted to raise our children in Auburn. <clears throat> but um, to that point, um, up until actually last night, after I had already decided, yes, I'm going to come speak um, publicly on, on a Tuesday night, when I'm coaching my nine-year-old son, which is my last son to come through the house, and we're playing the games on the old landfill at the Shug, and in his nine-year-old little mind before the game looks out and says, Daddy, have you ever noticed how many hills are on this football field? And it is, that's laughable to me. Um, it's, it's a, uh, it's no, it's no secret. We're in a, we're in a tight spot. We're growing way, way fast. We don't have facilities. We can, we can sit here all night and try to figure out how to fix this problem. Um, we're not going to do that. But as I was sitting in my office today, I wanted to just bring one thing and now it's not my job to run a city. Um, and I did stay in a Holiday Inn Express last night, but <laughs> but here's here's one thing that I want to do, guys, is because this is the world that I live in. I've been raising my kids 
Um, we're athletes. My wife's an athlete. And we're, we're football, we're baseball, we're, we're all over the place. Now, the reason you don't see a lot of parents here on Tuesday nights is because we're at practice with our kids. We're at games with our kids. We feel like we're not being heard. It's to the point, ladies and gentlemen, that probably when Cam gets through in two or three years, I'm going to roll off of the board because I am tired of going to practices and games and having to speak on behalf of the Park and Rec board. When I moved here eight years ago, I heard a lot of positivity. But the last four to five years ago, or it's just negative. It's negative. It's negative. It's complaining. These parents, they're, they're complaining. It's not a good place. It's not what I thought. And so I don't like negativity. I don't want to be around it. But here's the one thing that I do want to end up on <clears throat> and share with you is that um, with my children, travel sports is huge, okay? Now, I know we didn't want to jump into this, but I'm just going to lightly touch on this, okay? The days of park and rec ball um, were good. They're still here. But ladies and gentlemen, trying to figure out how we're going to put one project here to accommodate, as you mentioned, a certain amount of basketball teams and then a certain amount of here and a certain amount of here. To be quite honest with you, we need about three or four of these places, okay? Now, I know that's easier said than done, but we've got to figure out how to do it, okay? Now, the only thing that from my perspective and for conversations that I've had with people within the Park and Rec Department is I want to share some statistics with you really, really fast, okay? According to the National Sports Events Tourism Association, $39.7 billion on the direct spending impact of amateur and youth sports tourism in 2021 generated a total economic impact of $91.8 billion, which resulted in the generation <coughs> excuse me, of 635,000 jobs and a total tax revenue of $12.9 billion for the local economies. Now, the reason I share these statistics with you is because as I've traveled around on the weekends around the state of Alabama and in Georgia and in Tennessee and feeding my money to other hotel rooms and, or, or hotels and gas stations and restaurants, is that through my sports connections is that people look at me and say, Chad, why in the world in Auburn, Alabama, when, when it is booming, when it is thriving, it is a hotbed gold mine for travel sports, okay? And, and this is something that not everybody's familiar with, but this is the world that I live in. And so <clears throat> every weekend we go, we spend money in other places when we're sitting here trying to figure out where do we get money, where do we get money, where do we get money? Build the facility like... Albertville, Alabama, close to Boaz, okay? Google Earth and see what they built and they're hosting tournaments of everything. Football, baseball, swimming, basketball, lacrosse, you name it. Mommies and daddies are going to pay the money so that their little kids can be on a travel team, not necessarily a rec team, and that is going to bring income and revenue, okay? That's the last thing I'll say. Excuse me, <clears throat> because Auburn's always been a university town. Um, all university towns, uh, it's just it's economic numbers, um, usually thrive on athletic programs or whatnot. Look for other streams of revenue and income other than just Auburn University, as you mentioned, five weekends out of a year. Um, so I know I got a little long-winded, I get a little passionate, I get a little fired up. You can see the athlete in me. But um, it is what it is. I, I hope I'm, I'm not falling on deaf ears, but it's like I said, for two or three years, people are going to want me to come speak on behalf of the parents. Frustrated. Frustrated. Last thing I'm going to say, where do we practice? Where do we go? Chains are on the fences on the weekends. We can't get on the fields. Then through the week, they're packed out. We don't have anywhere to play, practice. It is what it is. It's frustrating. It is. So please, please, please 
dig down, find a way, generate some revenue, some budgeting, whatever. It's like I said, this sounds all great and wonderful, but this should have happened four or five years ago, six years ago. And like I said, we need about three or four of these Lake Wilmores. Is it going to happen? I don't know. Because most parents have just said, you know what? My kids are already grown, and let's let the next ones handle it. So um, that's the fact of the matter. I'm sorry. I don't mean to bring or be the bearer of bad tidings, but that's the way that most of your parents that want to have athletic children growing up are looking at the city of Auburn and the Parks and Rec Department. So um, anyway, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Who be next? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Hey, I'm Stacy Sharp Giles. I live at 1770 Fieldstone Lane. <clears throat> and I serve on the Park and Rec Advisory Board, and I feel kind of weird with my back to the crowd. Um, I, I didn't prepare the back. I just did the front. Sorry. You're so, good. You're good. Um, <laughs> there you go. I just did this part. Yeah. So um, there you go. Um, but uh, I've, I've served on the Park and Rec Board for about four years now, and it, it has been a, a labor of love. Um, I was one of those parents that was griping at while at, you know at the practice fields. I was griping while we were practicing in a parking lot. I was griping when we were park practicing in a mosquito pit. I, you know, I was one of the big complainers, and so I was eager to be on this board. And I have learned that oh my gosh, this is a hard job. This is um, I think Becky Richardson does a great job. Uh, her job is basically herding cats. Um, she, she, has, uh, she has so many things going, and what I thought would be a simple solution is not a simple solution. Um, but I think this is a step in the right direction. Um, growth is painful, we all know that. Uh, change is hard, I, and that's, that's just what we're facing in Auburn. But um, my job on the Park and Rec Board is to be an advocate for our community, and also for our Park and Rec Board to say that we're doing the best you know, right now we are doing what we can do, what we can afford to do. Um, we're hoping that, that uh, the funding will come in, that we can expand that. Um, and we want to be a good steward of the money that, that we are brought in. Uh, my, my big thing I like to say is we get more bang for our buck. I, I would like to see that more, more kids are touched, more lives are touched, more, more people have benefits from what we build. And I feel like so many more people are going to benefit from this facility than, uh, than any other thing we could do at this point in time. Um, I was had a lot of things to say, but uh, Megan Crouch had a lot of, took my points. She must have read Sorry. my notes. Sorry. I know I wrote big, so she read my notes. So did Brian, so did Chad. But, um, I, you know, I was going to spout some numbers, but they've already said it. You know, we've got a thousand over a thousand kids trying to play basketball this winter. That's a hundred and four teams. A hundred and four teams. That's insane when we're dealing with two, maybe four places for that to happen. Um, you know, my kids have played soccer, basketball, football, what baseball. They played it all. Um, the need here is is unbelievable for to cover basketball to cover indoor sports such as um such as volleyball um we, we really have to address that i think this is probably the best thing i love how the the uh, plan has be, been redesigned it's much farther away from oak knoll circle which if i lived on oak knoll i wouldn't want that parking lot in my backyard you know I, the way it was originally drawn i, I wouldn't have wanted that this is much nicer. We have a good break between Ogletree Elementary School. Uh, you see there's, um, we have that little field back there that they call a baseball field, sort of, whatever. It's really bad for playing baseball. But there's that little bitty field. Then we have a large um, area of wooded area that gives a, a buffer. Um, it's it's going to be it's going to be doable, and it's not going to be the impact on the neighbors and on the school that a lot of people are thinking. So I just wanted to say that I, I encourage everyone to support this effort. And um, thanks to everybody on the board for all the time and effort. And, um, 
and all the care and concern because it's really there. Y'all, y'all may not see see that we're doing it, but but there's a lot of care and concern. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you for your service. Who will be next? Yes, sir. Yes, my name is uh, John Guest, and I live on uh, 731 Oak Knoll. I wrote each of you uh, a letter outlining uh, four concerns. And one of the first things I wanted to make clear uh, tonight was that the concerns were really questions, and, and we're looking for more information. <clears throat> and thanks to the presentation that you did, I'm down to one concern. <laughs> so thank you very much for that, and I appreciate that. And, and it looks like you're doing a good job of due diligence. So the, the remaining item that I'm concerned about is, <clears throat> is the water flow off, the outflow from the stormwater. And what would be, what I'd be interested in is a, a kind of a design review when you're to that point uh, to see how it's being managed and how it's being handled. But the floodplain has already increased somewhat, just a little, and um, it could be affected fairly easily because a lot of a lot of the ground is fairly flat. So we, we've got your question, and we'll look into it, and we'll get back in touch with you. How about that? That'd be fair. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your email. Yes, sir. Who'll be next? All right, we got two people standing up at the same time. Y'all want to draw straws or big numbers? All right. <laughs> My name is AJ Harris, four one five six Mar Vista Drive. Um, Mayor Anders and City Council people, I appreciate y'all allowing us to speak today. Um, first, I want to commend the Parks and Rec um, staff. If you have any inclination of what they've had to do with, um, deal with over the last couple of years, is um, not even on the athletic side, but we're missing a component of the programming side when we talk about camps, um, the ability to host events. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we're going to impact um, by having this facility. Um, I sit on the Parks and Rec Advisory Board. We held a lot of meetings. Um, had a lot of people come in. We heard from staff, um, from the athletics to the programming staff. This building, this facility is a step in the di right direction to help solve a lot of the issues to be able to serve more people. A lot of this stuff that we're doing, we're having to cut off and turn people away. Um, this will give us the ability to serve more residents, I think, as a community as we grow. Um, that's one thing that we need. Um, from me, I wear a lot of different hats. Um, I coach travel basketball. We try to be an extension of what the um, Parks and Rec League is. As you've heard, there's not a lot of, lot of travel um, opportunity when you do the Parks and Rec, um, just due to sheer numbers. Um, we struggle with um, facilities. Ms. Becky and their staff does work with us to allow us to practice, but having an opportunity for us to even get in and work with kids, the, the, the youth are hungry for more sports. Is you, any sports you play now is almost a year-round thing, whether it's baseball, basketball, Ball, football, but providing opportunities for people to be able to um, even do that. Um, I, I know a couple months ago, even a dad wanted to go play basketball with his son. Didn't have an opportunity to go inside because all of our facilities are locked up with different sports throughout the day. Um, so I think, you know, as we look at this plan, um, the staff, um, all of the city staff has done a great job planning this out. Um, I, uh, I just don't think you're going to get a better option than what we have here. Like I said, we're not going to solve all these problems that we have overnight, but I think this is a step showing that the city is dedicated to our youth, to our city. And I keep, we keep focusing on youth, but this is going to impact, you know, um, people of all ages. So I think we have one thing that kind of, um, you know, bites at the puzzle, and we'll keep building on that as the years come. But thank you all, and you all doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Appreciate your service on the Parks and Rec Board. Yes, sir. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Andrew McKay, 2520 Tetbury Court. Um, my wife and I moved back 12 years ago to Auburn. Uh, immediately got involved in Parks and Rec, volunteering, trying to help out. Uh, literally just came from football practice, so that's why you have to excuse me. Left my son at football practice to come. Um, I have a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a four-year-old. Uh, we play football, baseball, basketball, soccer. Um, I have coached football, flag football, baseball, softball, t-ball, basketball. Um, what else is there? Besides soccer, I feel like I've done a pretty good job. I don't think anybody wants me to coach soccer again. That's a different story. There's a lot of you guys in this room whose kids I have coached over the years. Before I had kids of my own, I was coaching in this town. Um, I've had the unique opportunity and the blessing to be the all-star baseball coach five times, represent the city that way, as well as sit on the football board and the baseball board, uh, serving as the president of both of those over the last two years. So 
have a unique perspective, I feel like, of anybody in this room who knows what happens in Parks and Rec from a board member standpoint, a parent standpoint, and also a coach standpoint of what we're dealing with. Um, guys, a lot of stuff has already been said. I think Ms. Megan did a wonderful job outlining um, the numbers and stuff like that. I'm not going to talk about numbers. I'm just going to talk about the kids. We literally, Chad mentioned it, guys, we play football in a landfill, right? We joke as coaches as to what plays we're going to call depending on which side of the hill we're running up, right? I mean, that's just, it is what it is, and it's terrible. And I know we're doing what we can do, but this solves that problem, right? Lacrosse has nowhere to go. I know nothing about lacrosse at all, but I know they got nowhere to go, right? They have nowhere to practice. Basketball, like you said, 9.30, 10 o'clock at night for kids on a school night, it's terrible. You know, baseball. I mean, guys, we have t-ball kids and 12-year-olds that play on the same field, right? And you take a 12-year-old group that plays on a size field that's too small, and you take them to a state tournament to compete, and all of a sudden the fence is 50 feet further, and they're going, we don't know what to do. Ball goes a whole lot further, right? Because we have t-ball kids at six and seven playing on the same fields. Right? We take ground balls, like Brian said, on the Duck Sanford parking lot field. No 12 year old needs to be doing that. Busted lips, busted noses. Guys, we've, in the 12 years that we've been back, there's not been a single new facility built. Not one for Parks and Rec. 2005 was the last time we built a new facility with a new duck for the World Series. 17 years. I was in college still. I'm old now, but back then, I remember when it was being built, it was like, hey, this is great. This is going to be awesome. We moved back, and nothing's happened. So I would just say, from my perspective, as a parent who is not getting to put his four-year-old to bed tonight because I'm here to talk to you, this is what we need. It doesn't solve all of our problems, but it solves a whole lot of them at one time. So I would just strongly, strongly urge you to look at it for what it is, and take a good first step. Thank you. Thank you. Who'll be next? Yes, sir. Hey, how y'all doing today? Um, <laughs> William Elston, I'm in part of Ward 3, um, uh, 1588 Jimson Place. Um, I'm just gonna add a different perspective to it. I've been in here in Auburn, I guess, about 13 years myself. Um, I moved here from Birmingham. Um, my kids have grew up in Auburn sports. I have been fortunate enough to coach travel basketball here, um, rec ball, uh, done uh, basketball, helped out with football with, with Danny and some more guys. Um, but the perspective I'm going to add to it is I know we're going to build a new facility, I'm hoping, and it's going to include a swimming pool. People don't think about that, but my kids actually swam competitively before I even moved here. Um, when I first moved here, I had to end up going to Opelika and use their sports place because they had a swim team. And that's the sport my kids were in. Luckily, I moved to Auburn, and I commuted back and forth. But at that time, I felt like, hey, I might move to Opelika because they've got the things that I'm looking for. And that I didn't, my kids were able to excel. They both played college. Uh, one plays college basketball. The other one played college football here at Auburn. He plays college football at Sanford because of the Auburn Park and Recreation and Athletics here. And... One of my biggest things is to one day have a swimming pool because I figured out the world is 80% water. Um, it's the only sport you can learn to save your life to me. And a lot of people don't get that opportunity because they don't have the facilities to learn some basic skill as to being able to swim, not ride a bike, not throw a football, not hit a baseball, but this is something they can learn to one day save their life or somebody else. And they might give an opportunity. So if we don't get the five kids that learns how to swim, I feel like it's worth that. Um, so I'm not going to speak about basketball or football or all those things like that, but just take consideration of the facilities that we'll have that people will learn life lessons in that this would go forward to helping them out. And thank you all for your time. Thank you. Who'll be next? My name is Robert Cribo, and I live at 674 Ogletree Road, right across the street from the proposed park. <clears throat> the area where the park is going to be built 
is currently a residential area, and any proposed c conditional use should be required to do what they can to minimize the damage, the impact on the existing neighborhood. In this case, I could reasonably see a, reasonably argue that a well-run community center, a swimming pool, and a park could easily be accommodated without destroying the neighborhood. But when you start talking about fields, and the fields are described very generally, multiple use, but there are different kinds of fields, and there are different kinds of lights that are required for those. You can have tennis courts, pickleball courts, with relatively low lights. When you start talking about soccer and football, you're talking about what's out at Wire Road. And if you go out and look at Wire Road at night, where they have, what, 70-foot tires of lights out there, that's not appropriate for a residential area. None of you would want those in your backyard. And so I, I recommend that we do this part, do it the right way. Put the items that are appropriate for the area there. As I said, I think this, the community center works. I think the swimming pool works. Frisbee golf would work. Tennis courts would work. Probably pickleball works. When we start talking about football and soccer, that doesn't work. That's not the right place. And I've heard at least two other locations were mentioned as the city owns. Maybe they're the appropriate place for the big fields. I mean, when you have these big fields, you have traffic problems, you have crowd problems, you have noise problems, you have light problems. They all affect the residential community, which is a relatively quiet community now. You know, they, we have the zoning restrictions, and I think you ought to follow, uh, 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 at least stick with the uh, intent of the zone. I mean, you expect that when developers build things that they have projects that are compatible with the area zoning. I think the city ought to do the same thing. That's all I have to say. Yes, sir. Thank you. Who will be next? Good evening. I'm uh, Gabe Gross, live at 1733 Glendale Circle. Um, I just wanted to be, I, I think, maybe the only person to come up uh, in support of this that maybe hadn't served on a committee, uh, <laughs> hadn't served on a Parks and Rec. I think your um, credentials are understandable, yeah, Gabe, but uh, please go ahead. But uh, I have coached uh, Parks and Rec uh, for a long, long time. Uh, I, I think of my list of coaching duties would be very similar uh, from soccer, t-ball, baseball, softball, uh, flag football, basketball, which I'm about to get ready to start coaching again. Uh, and uh, I couldn't agree more with a couple of different points that were brought up. One, um, you know, the, the, the lack of facilities is enormous right now. I'm not, I don't have a dog in the fight about where all this stuff is going or where it might need to go, um, but it's needed. And it's needed in a way that uh, I don't even have the words to really describe uh, as far as uh, going back and coaching and coaching these young kids, uh, not even uh, high school kids practicing late, but uh, I know last year we were practicing, I think, about 8.30 at night with uh, 10, 11-year-olds uh, in basketball and uh, baseball. Uh, we having to go right now. I do coach a travel or help coach a travel team in baseball, and we have to go to Beauregard uh, to, get, to get to a practice field facility instead of in Auburn. Uh, I hold Auburn in an extremely high regard, and that hurts my heart. Uh, it hurts my heart when I – look around and we've gone to travel ball tournaments and I feel like Opelika has got better facilities and Valley's got better facilities and LaGrange has got better facilities and everywhere we go has better and more facilities than Auburn does and like I said I hold Auburn to an extremely high uh, standard in my eyes because it's a very special place to live. It's, it's awesome. Uh, I would say too that this is badly needed as it is. Uh, I would very much encourage every one of you to view this as a first step this is, <laughs> you're climbing a very high hill and this is just one step in it because we are, uh, we are very far behind. And uh, I think if, beyond saying that I agree with multiple people and everything that was said, uh, if I could leave you with that, is just that not only is this needed, um, but it's just a very small step in what's really needed to get Auburn to a level where it's servicing uh, the young men and young women uh, from an athletic point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Who'll be next? Eric McDade, 
2163 Ashley Court. Um, I was called to come do this 30 minutes before, so I didn't prepare anything <laughs> to say. Um, I've coached athletics in Auburn. I grew up in Auburn. I agree with everything that everybody behind me has said. The one thing I want to do is speak for the people who aren't here, and that's the kids, right? I was one of those kids that grew up in this city that loved to play basketball. And when I was 10 years old, I started playing rec basketball. And I used to go to Frank Brown, and I used to go to Boykin. Those are the two places we had to go play basketball. My daughter's 11 years old. She wants to start playing basketball. The two places she has to go to play, Frank Brown and Boykin. The same places that were there 25 years ago. For this city, it's, that's unacceptable to me. And this is not about us trying to create professional athletes. This is about us trying to create young men and young women that can be leaders in our community. I own a business in Opelika, and if it wasn't for the lessons I learned on the basketball court, I wouldn't be standing before y'all today, right? I can't tell you how many kids that I coached that come up to me still and say, basketball changed my life. Some of them, basketball saved their lives, right? My granny used to tell me all the time, an idle mind is the devil's playground. If you don't get these kids something to do, they'll find something to do, right? I don't care if it's basketball, soccer, baseball, whatever it is, they need things to do. I go all over this state with my son who plays soccer, my daughter who does cheer, all these kids that play basketball with the Raptors, and I see all these facilities that everybody else has that we don't have in Auburn, Alabama, which to me is the greatest city in the United States of America. I love this place. And it's unacceptable. It's embarrassing when we have Hoover come down here for a soccer tournament and they say, we won't play on y'all's field. We're going to go back to Hoover if we got to play on this field tomorrow. It's incredible that we even have the type of basketball teams and the soccer teams and the football teams that we have with these kind of facilities for these kids to play on when they're growing up. That's a testament to everybody that's in here that coaches these kids when they're this tall. Imagine what we could have if we got our facilities up to par or better than what everybody else has. So to me, this is not something that we want. This is something that we need in the city of Auburn. So I'll leave y'all with that. I hope y'all do the right thing. And thank you, Mayor Anders. You, you, you know about me on that basketball court and coaching. So this is, I know. I'm, I'm gonna hold that over your head all the time, but truly this is something that we all need. And I, and I hope that you, know, you all choose to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. What Eric is referring to is that when my son was in fifth grade, his team beat us in the city championship by one. Thank you, Eric. Hello, hello. Hey. My name is Pam Haney. I'm at 906 Bibb Avenue. So, um, like a few others, I am here in support of the kids, and I represent Auburn Youth Lacrosse. So we are kind of the orphaned in this, in a sense, of we are not a parks and rec sport, and we are not a school sport, but we are a club. Um, we have, coming this spring, over probably 250 kids that will be in our organization from kindergarten through 12th grade. Our kids play many different sports. It's not just lacrosse. They, we have many athletes that go on to pursue different careers and, and higher level with alternative sports besides lacrosse. But lacrosse provides a foundation for them. When we talk about coaching and stuff, so I have been coaching in Parks and Rec for eight years I did, and then my daughter decided to shift from softball and pursue lacrosse, so I shifted also. As of now, I am the girls varsity head coach. And I want to share with you kind of our purpose. So our purpose is to empower young female athletes to have confidence in sports through life by providing a structured environment that cultivates independent thinking, self-discipline, a willingness to try, determination, teamwork, a community, and a love for the game of lacrosse. So we are trying to develop these athletes into great citizens, ones that are respected in the schools, in the community. As of right now, we chase a field to play on. <laughs> I have, with my varsity girls, we have U14 that also practices with us, and we practice in three different cities during the week. On Monday nights, we get to be in Auburn. On Tuesday nights, we're, and sometimes Monday nights, we go to Opelika, because that's the only field that we can get with lights. 
On Tuesday nights, we get to sometimes be in Auburn, sometimes we chase outside. Thursday nights, we're in Beauregard, and we're, we're very grateful for the travel team that is using the field with lights because they let us come into the outfield. We go out into a, a tiny outfield to be able to practice because we don't have the facilities necessary here. And we're just two of the programs, or excuse me, two of the teams in our program where we have a whole boys side that practices multiple nights a week and other youth girls that need to practice. One of the things that is off so difficult to kind of wrap around, like I've heard you guys talk about safety tonight. I don't know if you can see my eye. So it's pretty bad looking. So last night I took a ball to the face. <laughs> so I was struck by a ball. It was not, um, it was an accident. I was standing behind the goal and, and I don't really look at it as an injury, I look at it as progress because I have a girl that came out that could not, could not make the shot. Worked and worked and worked. It's rolling around the goal to score into the goal. She finally mastered it with her right hand. This child has developmental issues where she needs additional help. She needs additional coaching and facilitating of having a safe environment to play in. Last night, she was, I want to do it with my left hand. Do it with your left hand. You know, to say it didn't end well for me, but she came out of it just ecstatic and just so proud that she could do it. So it's about progress. It's about creating a space for these kids. It's also about safety. So looking at this, this eye, so most of the time we're on PIC. PIC has no lights. Right now we're chasing daylight. We have to pull kids extra early simply because you can't see. And if you can't see the ball, inevitably you're going to possibly get injured. It, it's not a safe space with the current facilities that we have for our kids. We need to be able to provide fields for now in the fall and in the spring and in the summer for these kids to be able to practice on. Um, it's interesting. So today I actually saw a post from Carrie Woods. So on their parent group for my kids went through Carrie Woods and now they're at the, both at the junior high. Um, Carrie Woods has a hashtag that says whatever it takes. Hashtag whatever it takes. Those teachers will sit in a room, that administrative staff, all of those that are working in that school, whatever it takes for the kids, for them to develop. And so I ask you to please approve this because when we talk about whatever it takes, this is the next step of what it does take to provide these safe environments, this necessary environment for all of our kids to continue to develop here in youth sports. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tricia Campbell. I live at 308 Kimberly Drive. I want to thank all of y'all for taking the time to listen to our citizens tonight. Um, I wanted to come tonight particularly because I don't have any children in the parks and rec system. My children are all grown. And so I wanted y'all to hear from somebody that doesn't have an interest in making something better for their child right now. I feel so strongly that this is what our community needs. Um, my girls all grew up in the rec system. And they're not athletes. I think Chief Dawson will attest to that, to that. He coached one of my daughters in softball. You know, we're the ones at the park and rec at 930 at night. Uh, one of my daughters played lacrosse. The city is not trying to build athletes through their parks and rec. They're trying to build people. They're trying to build quality people that know how to work on a team, that know how to respect rules, and to respect others. And the, the community, we just need to pour into that concept, not only for our children, but for everybody in our community. And I just, I guess I want to leave you with this. I also grew up in Auburn, moved away, moved back. We have the same number of basketball facilities now as we did when I was a child. When I was a child, we had three elementary schools. By my count, I think we have nine. We are so underserving our city. And so I just ask you to take consideration for this is a great first step, but then let's take this and build and make it even better for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Next, yes ma'am. Um, I'm Sherry Chapel from 701 Oak Knoll Circle, and I just wanted to speak for just a second um, 
for the surrounding neighbors around the park. Um, we totally support the need for more facilities uh, from the rec department. We understand that completely. Um, there's no denying the need for it. Our um, challenges were not understanding the changes, the change that went from the uh, original concept map to what we're doing now are awesome. I think there was some misunderstanding um, about where we were going and where we're at. So I just wanted to say that I appreciate the compromise um, and leaving some of the natural areas around that we were concerned about. You're taking just half of what we were concerned about for the, for the, um, the rec center and the parks, uh, the ball fields that are there, but you're leaving, what did you say, about 100 acres? 120. Yeah, that, um, that we were concerned about. Um, the topography of that area, the, um, the, the old growth trees, we loved having the walking path and the bike trails. So I just wanted to say that I appreciate um, you working with the surrounding neighborhood. We still have some concerns with the ball fields and the lighting, but I just felt like we felt good about the City of Auburn um, team that was trying to, make the, trying to make it work for all of us. We support the facilities, we know the need, um, but we also wanted to keep that area that was more natural. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for your email. Who will be next? Hey guys, good afternoon. My name's Danny Alban, 425 Stanfield Drive. Um, I'm here as a parent, a coach, and just wanted to share just uh, as a coach, just um, around basketball mainly, because that's kind of what got me out of, uh, I was, grew up as a, with a single mother household. Basketball was my out, you know, Practicing all the time helped a lot, but basically, uh, back in 2005, I started coaching every sport. Um, my son now, he's 22, he's out of Parks and Rec. My 15-year-old, he's out of Parks and Rec, but, you know, Chad, Brian, just, I mean, they're, they're, basically what they're saying is the same thing I went through, especially on the football field, just little different things like that, but <clears throat> I wanted to put in perspective kind of as a coach, just so you guys can, can understand, um, Becky and that team has done an amazing job. Every single year, I, I complain and gripe all the time about practice space. I'm a coach that likes to teach the game, not just coach it, if you know what I mean. I'd, I'd like to take players and get them better at the sport. And uh, when you have 45 minutes once a week in basketball to try to do something with it, it gets a little uh, frustrating. And um, I'm real passionate about teaching kids. And, you know, that's why in 2008, me and a group of guys, um, we started an organization called the Auburn Raptors, Travel Basketball. And that was one of the reasons why we did that is because, you know, coming through Parks and Rec basketball, great, we had fun, it was awesome, but you didn't have many games and you definitely didn't have many practices just due to the facilities and nowhere to go. So um, we started the Raptors and then we bumped in the same problem, nowhere to practice. So uh, <laughs> here we are again. And that was back in 2000, 2008. And as a coach, just practicing once a week uh, for 45 minutes, you're not getting much done. Um, sometimes if you're with the younger generation, you're herding cats for about 20 minutes and then a little bit of, a little bit more time, you know, co uh, trying to teach the game. But it's pretty it's really tough. And, uh, you know, as a, as a kid growing up, you know, learning that it, sports was my out with a single mother, you know, that my mom, you know, if you don't act right, your grades don't get better. You're not playing next week, you know, all that kind of thing. But I want you guys to think about the kids that have to be put on the waiting list because there's not enough teams. And, you know, I, I'm, that, I'm that coach that I want the kids that don't have fathers in their lives. That's, that's the kind of coach I want. I want, I, want, I, want to be, I want to have those kids so I can be that mentor. But there's just so many kids that, <clears throat> that they don't register in time because, you know, Internet. They don't have Internet. They don't have the funds. They don't know the deadlines. They don't have any of that information. So having kids not be able to play sports that they're trying to do because there's not enough teams, because we can't have enough teams, because we won't have enough facilities to manage the games and the practice, that's pretty tough. Um, so those numbers would be a lot bigger and a lot more if we had the facilities, I promise you. So I deal with a lot of parents that, that, that try to come to Raptors because it's out there, it's on social media, you know, everybody's talking about it, and they want to play basketball, and we're in the same situation. So... You know, I know football and all that's important, but and I, and I completely understand everybody that lives in that community. Uh, I'm with you. I mean, I live around the corner, but 
at the end of the day, it, it's called change, and none of us like change, but it, it's the future of Auburn. I mean, we're growing, and we're not trying to grow. I think it's just happening, and we have to have something quick. And thank you for sharing the slides and, and the, the, the information, because I didn't know that there was other opportunities, and this was the main opportunity, the location. So, you know, I definitely can hear everybody's, under, you know, especially the ones that live locally and the lights and stuff, but, you know, it, it, it is what it is, sadly to say, you know, we need it. Um, if a kid doesn't have anything to do, sometimes some, certain kids pick the wrong thing to do. So I know sports has always been an out. It's been an out for me. Um, that's one of our things with the Raptors is, is, is you know, we, we talk, you know, we, we're all about, you know, the student athlete. We're all about education. We're all about doing the right thing. All of my coaches in my program, they talk about life. They do life lessons. They're in the kids' lives from here on out. I mean, I still stay in contact with 24-year-old kids that I coached in Raptors that have families now. And I, you know, I've, you know, it's just, it's long-term, but you got to have facilities to develop that relationship. And you got to, and you, you just got to have that to keep things going. And Auburn's going to keep growing if we can continue to build things like that. So thank you guys. Thank you. Who will be next? Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Robert McKay. I live at 740 Kentwood Drive in Auburn. And uh, I stand uh, pointing to put my objection onto the record on the way that this was handled primarily. Um, nobody wants to stand up here and be against nine-year-old kids playing ball. I had four boys that are all grown now, and ball fields are, are particularly important. Um, and I also understand that, you know, we all don't have the same perspective. And I was in law enforcement for 25 years. I'm a retired police officer. And most disputes are a matter of uh, perspective. And I want to give you my perspective here. Moving here two years ago, the first official city notice that I got of this project was last Tuesday, inviting me to a planning meeting on Thursday night. I appreciate that you all went through a very big process in 2018 but all of those permits are expired. And there's a reason why there's an expiration date on permits is because things change. People move into the neighborhood, floodplains change. And part of the process that we have here in city government, it's called due process. It's, it's notice and the opportunity to be heard in a meaningful way. And I believe that I have not had that opportunity to be heard in this process. The first time I'm seeing the plans are on Thursday night. I live on Kentwood Drive. One of the primary concerns of me purchasing that property was the peacefulness of the neighborhood. And now the plans, as they've been changed, seem very reasonable. But I had no voice in any of this process. And basically, I would ask that the city, city council actually go through the same process that you went in 2018 and actually have some meetings. The plans have changed since then. I think the plans are probably better. I think there are different things that we could work on together to address the concerns of the community. I'm concerned that people are going to be eventually coming through Kentwood Drive. They're going to be late for practice, and they're going to be driving 55 miles an hour down my residential street. And I think there are ways that we could address that, perhaps through the process, with speed bumps, no parking signs, different things like that. But because we've jumped the gun and there's this exigency that doesn't necessarily exist, we're just going to approve the plan as it was in 2018 without my input and others' input. So I appreciate where everybody's coming from. I understand um, nobody wants to be against ball fields. Um, but I want to be for a reasonable process where everybody's voice is heard and that we can work through some of these concerns that were aired last Thursday night at the Planning Commission. Thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm. Megan, this project is not going to, Kentwood is not going to connect all the way to this project, correct? In the first phase. The, yes. uh, I don't, I don't want to sit here and say that it would never connect. That's ultimately going to be up to the City Council, but there is right-of-way that goes through here to Grove Hill Road. Um, and we had met with the neighbors. You can see Kentwood on this bigger thing going to, to Winway. Um, to say it would never connect is not accurate, but I, that will be ultimately up to the city council. What we did say in 2018 in meeting with neighbors on Kentwood in a meeting 
directly on Kentwood Drive was that we wouldn't do it in the initial phase. Um, and so that there's going to be varying opinions of the people who live in that area and the, the users of the park, and that will ultimately be up to the council. Uh, but at this time, also there's similar concerns from people in Grove Hill about VFW and about Grove Hill Road. And all master plans do show eventual connections. Again, that's a master plan, but that will be up to the city council. Uh, but pedestrian and bicycle <laughs> access into this area from Kentwood will be, it's, it's happening now and it will continue to happen. Um, they, you know, they're, if the residents in that area want on-street parking removed and they, they come before you and say, hey, we want you to look at this and we want all parking on this street to be removed and we're good with it, and a lot of times council does that. And I think that's something as the park gets used and things get open that we'll determine. Okay. Who'll be next? I'm Lisa Champy Sampson, 984 Fairview Drive. Another basketball um, coach. Uh, my dad was women's basketball coach at Auburn. We moved here in 79. Um, I can tell you the facilities that I played with Parks and Rec are the same that my kids that are now grown and out of high school, same gyms. Um, very excited about this project. I know with any new projects, there's going to be things you have to agree upon and work through. Um, but very excited. Um, what basketball, what Raptors give to these kids is much more than, much more than basketball. Um, and we want to be able to serve as many kids as possible. And just like Chad said too as well, with the travel basketball, the opportunities that we would have with a new facility or several new facilities to bring tournaments here is great. Everybody wants to come to Auburn. Um, we deal with the Youth Basketball of America, and there, we used to have tournaments here, and the facilities just are not the same as in other cities. So um, I know that we could put tournaments, basketball tournaments here every weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Who will be next? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Any comments or questions from the council? I, have, I do. I have several. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, as I sit here and I listen at uh, everybody talk and speak on this uh, new facilities out uh, on Wilm Wilmore Park, Lake Wilmore Park, uh, I, I think about when my kids was coming up, uh, my three sons was coming up, and I know Becky know all three of them, and they played uh, sports here in Auburn. And they also, there was only minimum places that they could play. And I was just fortunate enough every year that they got on the basketball list. But there was other kids out there that, could, you know, was on a waiting list. And uh, so I personally um, tonight is going to support this. But um, I want to uh, speak on one of the things that the coach said about it being much needed, uh, these facilities being much needed throughout Auburn. I think Lake Wilmore is going to be a great start, but it, they are needed throughout the city of Auburn. Uh, biggest Auburn is and has grown and everything. I think there's need to be one here, here, and here, and there, wherever we can put them at. And we'll hopefully one day the city can afford to put those where they are needed for everybody to be able to have assets as it to those uh, places, um, it seems like uh, this area is a long ways off, but sometimes we have to do what we have to do to get our children where they need to be. And um, so I do support us uh, looking into more facilities on down the line. And when we talk about, uh, uh, there was a gentleman got up and talked about the swimming pools and stuff. Uh, right now, I think Megan said that there was on, at, at this time, there's on Sanford. Yes, ma'am. And I think there was, um, in the past, there was talk about uh, a swimming pool coming over in the second phase of, uh, at Boykin, and that changed, and I think that changed simply because of the heated pool that everybody was 
you know, came before the city council and they talked about, so I think this it, it now is the best location for that heated pool, but I, th I hope in the, in the future that we can still um, maybe one day get a big pool over in that area also. The other thing that uh, I wanted to talk about, I hear everybody talking about sports, and like I said, my sons grew up in sports. They was in the basketball, football, uh, b baseball, all those um, recreational sports, and even went on to high school and junior high in those same sports. But I have two scout troops, and some of those kids are not in sports. So, you, you know, we, we also have to think about these kids that may not uh, have the opportunity or even want to play sports. There may be some other things in their life they want to do. So, you know, I, I, I um, look at this, this drawing, and I think I saw something on him about a community center, which is much needed because there, there needs to be also places where we can um, have places in this community where kids who are not in sports, sports is a good thing, Hey, everybody gets something out of it, uh, especially football. I think football is the um, thing, basketball, those sports. But but we also have to think about the needs of those who are not, those kids who are not playing sports. And, and um, you know, we have scouts. Like I said, I have two scout troops. They're not boy scouts and, and girl scouts, but they, they I call, we call them scouts. They have a different name. And, and sometimes just trying to find... And our, um, my troops are expanding. We started off with seven kids. We're now up to 37 kids. And there's, and I was actually talking to someone from the Boys and Girls Club today, and we was, was talking about some of the, um, when you talk about a waiting list, you talk about us, a lot of these uh, community services, they're on waiting lists. Well, just so happened YFABs and MATCH. It's, it's the name of the two s troops that I have. There's not a waiting list. So, but but there's not facilities where we can actually house these kids and just really have uh, some of the things um, that they also need for life-long skills. And I say that because I'm very passionate, not just about kids play playing sports, but just kids just being a part of something. Um, arts and craft was a good thing that our kids did this past Sunday, and they enjoyed doing arts and craft. They enjoyed doing some of the things that us grown people like to do, such as bingo. And we had a different type of bingo that we played with the kids. You know, not the normal bingo, but but learning bingo. And so, you know, there's there's a lot of other opportunities out there. We're getting ready to take these kids camping. Uh, I would like, to, you know, maybe someday we can have some type of campground here that we can also offer those type of activities for our kids also and for kids to come into the area and do the same thing. So um, I'm, I'm just going to sum this up because, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm listening. And I'm very passionate with everybody who got up tonight and they spoke on uh, bringing this Lake We Are More into existence. And I do support it. So I am one of the council members. Before we even vote to let you know, I do support this. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Anyone else? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Sure. Um, since I've uh, come to council uh, and discovered the city's cultural master plan and uh, the vision that the Parks and Rec uh, Department has here, uh, it's really been one of the most exciting elements of being on this council. Um, we now in Ward 6 enjoy a magnificent facility in our inclusive playground. And I have uh, watched with great enthusiasm as we've uh, progressed uh, as a city to offer these types of services and quality of life issues for our citizens. And I was a little surprised watching the um, Planning Commission meeting online the other night, given that we passed this uh, some years ago with, with, with very little 
uh, with next to no opposition from the public as I remember it and a lot of enthusiasm, I'm certainly going to be supporting this um, proposal. I have three boys at my house who all like to swim and uh, um, that certainly will be a, an opportunity uh, that, that we will take advantage of and I'm very appreciative of the work that you've done. I really do hope that there is a, uh, an ongoing conversation to address some of these residential concerns, particularly the lighting. I'm really confident that at this point in time there are some compromises or some technology that we, we may be able to find that would minimise uh, light pollution of an evening. But uh, I'm, I'm thankful to be uh, able to vote on this tonight. Parsons, anyone else? I appreciate everybody who came to speak tonight. Thank you for being passionate, but being respectful. I'm very grateful for that on whatever side. I received some emails this week, and um, some were concerning. There was three of them, but they were respectful, and I'm grateful for that. And that is Auburn at its best when you carry your arguments in a very respectful manner. I appreciate that. Um, tonight you heard words such as landfill and parking lot and 930 on a school night and capacity limits. Um, this is why I'm passionate about this. This community is growing. If you come to the mayor's um, um, state of the city, you'll hear that we're growing by 6.6 .6 people a day in our community. I don't know who all those 6.6 .6 people are. I don't know what ages and stages of life they're in, but I guarantee you that a lot of those are children. And they're coming. And I was 11 years old when Frank Brown was opened. There hasn't been anything built since then, and I'm, I'm sad to tell you that's almost been 50 years ago. <laughs> and it's, it's time for us to play some catch-up. We we've got a wonderful, inclusive playground that is... Uh, we should all be proud of what we're doing for those families and those uh, individuals who need the, that equipment. We have had a kind family, the Denius family, give us a special little jewel on Glen Avenue. I don't know if all of you have been there to it. We've got Town Creek that is so much activity and positivity going on there with a beautiful cemetery that many of us say goodbye to our loved ones. And Kiesel Park continues to deliver. We have not kept up with our rec facilities for our children. We've just not done it. And there's a number of reasons why that's happened, and there's no reason to get back into that tonight. But we've got, we've got to start chipping away at this. And I agree with those who came up here tonight and recognize that there is no finality in what we're potentially doing here tonight. This is just the beginning. Because our community is continuing to grow, um, and we're going to need more. Um, in just a few weeks, the Super 7 will be coming to Auburn. There will be seven high school football championship games that will be conducted on a Wednesday through a Friday. But what you might not know is that the first game of that week is a girls' flag tag state championship game. And I firmly believe that the time will come really soon that the parents and the girls of our community will ask our Parks and Rec to deliver a program for girls' flag tag. And we're not even considering that as we sit here tonight. The lacrosse parents have done an unbelievable job. What a passionate group of people to birth that sport in our community. And they've got hundreds of young people, boys and girls, that are playing and have nowhere to go. I ride by the pick field all the time. They're wearing it out. God bless them. Wearing it out. The girls' volleyball is a sport that is growing, that competes with space for basketball and needs places to go. And you've heard the thousands of children that want to play, that soon will be play, trying to play basketball in our city. This is very important. And I encourage the council tonight to take this step to approve this project. This, this property was identified in 2002 to be parks and rec property for the, Auburn's future. In 2018, we put, a, we put a plan together. It was a vision. In 2020, we voted on this and couldn't get it done because of COVID. And we're back here tonight with advice and a desire and an ask from our Parks and Rec Advisory Board to add these four fields to provide a place for football and lacrosse,
to go in the fall and we can put backstops up and let kids learn how to play baseball and softball in the spring. It's not perfect, but it is so much better than a landfill or so much better than three football teams trying to practice on the outfield at Duck Sanford Park. We are, we are a community that has, um, is known for our, for our children, our education, our college, but we are known for our children. And all these people that have moved here that want to put their children in our systems, um, they're looking for places for their children to go. So I really encourage the city council to support this this evening. All right. We've got a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Item 10A3 is a request from David Slocum, a Pinnacle Design Group for conditional use approval of an industrial use manufacturing facility located at 2530 West Tech Lane in the Industrial Zoning District. This project is known as Shenhua. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its October 13th meeting. A public hearing is required. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion and second. This time we'll open the public hearing. If you'd like to address the City Council, please come forward and give us your name and address for the record. Okay, I think everybody that's rising is getting ready to leave and not wanting to address this. Mr. Cosgrove, do you want to talk about this particularly? I'm sorry, I thought this was the public. No, this is for this item on the agenda. Okay. I'm too tired. Okay. <laughs> all right, we'll close the public hearing. Any comments or questions from the council? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 10A4 is a request from Douglas Weston and Laura Lakov for conditional use approval of a commercial support use, climate controlled self storage, and a road service use truck and trailer sharing located at 136 West Creek Parkway in the Plan Development District with underlying comprehensive development district zones. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its October 13th meeting. A public hearing is required. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion to second. This time I'll open the public hearing. If you'd like to address City Council regarding this agenda item, please come forward and give us your name and address for the record. All right, seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. Any comments or questions from the Council? It was mentioned at the Planning Commission that this is a, an additional um, U-Haul um, operation, so the other one will still be in existence. I just wanted to make that comment. All right, any other comments or questions? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Mayor, those are all the items of business we have on the agenda this evening. Okay, this time we'll open the Citizens Open Forum. This is your opportunity to talk to the City Council about anything on your mind. Please come forward and give your name and address for the record. Please address all of your comments to the City Council. And remember, you have three minutes. Yes, sir. I'm Steve Cosgrove, and I, we live at 1927 Watercrest Drive, and... Ashton Park, at North Lakes, really fine. One of the many fine communities here in the, in the village of Auburn. Um, a couple things. I really applaud our city council, city management, back in Parks and Recreation, and all the, all the departments. And, it, 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 and uh, also uh, applaud the constituents who shared their heartfelt thoughts and suggestions in, in employing fashion and so forth. I really, really, really do. I, uh, I, brought, I brought something here to my old paper bag that was in our family since 1951. And so I, I got it out today and I, and I put together some little collector's items, the, the article that was put together on Felton Little Park. So there's, there's two of them in here. That I'm going to give these to Megan, I think that's the way we do it. I could, I could throw you the papers. I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at that. But, uh, Mr. Parsons can't catch very well. So I, I agree. <laughs> but if, if uh, I'll give, and there'll be one for everyone, including Becky and, and you, and and uh, Chief Register too. And um, but um, it felt a little park is a gem in the, in this in the city of Auburn. Some things really, really are worth preserving, like this old, like this old paper bag right here, my old ball glove, friendships, um, and I just, uh, 
I just really, really appreciate all the effort that's gone into that particular little place, that Felton Little Park, and what it what it means to uh, to the to the history and and the, and the people of Auburn. Um, I've got a lot of passion and a lot of love for for the city of Auburn and for for the time and effort and heart that you all dedicate to the well-being of Auburn. And I really, really, really want you to hear that. And I'm not going to have the chance to say goodbye, I don't think, to some of the folks that aren't here. I think is the next city council meeting, is it November? November 1st, and it'll be the last meeting for the three members that will. Okay, and then they, they get installed on November 7th. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay, well, I'd like to ex express thanks personally to each of them, but to each of you that are here right now, thank you so very much. Thank you, Really Steve. appreciate it. We appreciate it. Thank oh. you. Who'll be next? Okay. My name is uh, okay. Robert Wilkins, uh, 261 Denson Drive, Auburn, Alabama. I had a speech made up uh, to reprimand uh, the mayor and, and Dawson, but I'm not going to do that. After listening to all this, it reminded me a lot of my childhood, <clears throat> and I, I uh, think it's sad that the facilities aren't here. I'm glad to see that a lot of you are going to uh, try to do something about it. Uh, I live in a children's home in Selma, Alabama, and First time in my life, I had a place that I could actually go, and we had so many facilities. I was thinking about what this whole city has, and it doesn't have the facilities. We had a swimming pool, we had baseball field, uh, we had a football area, we had a tennis courts, uh, we had, um, um, let's see, we had basketball courts and all that. <clears throat> and I was just thinking, you know, that was by donations of Methodist uh, churches throughout the country. I mean, I'm sorry, throughout, <clears throat> I don't know what's wrong with my throat, throughout uh, Alabama and South, uh, Flo North Florida. And um, I uh, uh, really hate that y'all <coughs> have spent the money on going after us with short-term rental when that 100000 plus for the law, the legal portion already could have gone to that. The money lost that you got from the revenue could have gone to helping that each year. Uh, and, and the money spent on a vehicle and the, the different people. I just hate that th that was done, that we couldn't have worked out something that would have been where all that money could have stayed and gone for these kids. Because to me, that's, that's money that could have been there. And I, I hate it. I hate it. And uh, I hate that I have to come here uh, every <clears throat> council meeting to remind y'all uh, of the uh, losses uh, for a lot of people, 151 families. But mainly, the, the kids. The kids are the most important. I've done all my life, I have dealt with kids. Hugh O'Brien Youth Foundation, even on a national basis, because I believe in giving back. I felt like I was given so much, being adopted twice, being in a children's home, and um, being able to understand the best between right and wrong. And uh, so anyway, I just want to thank you, Council, for really wanting to make a difference. And please, heard this process. I knew nothing of this. Um, and I'm getting these V-packs uh, for the first time, and I love it. Uh, I hope that y'all should remind each mayor before you end, you should say how you can get on there and get the stuff. And then you put the stuff up here for the uh, lake. Uh, keep doing more of that, because having stuff visually, like I mentioned before, is so important. And uh, anytime you're doing any project, how it's going to look before, how it's going to look after, put it up here. It'd be beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who'll be next? Okay. Is there a move to adjourn? So moved. We're adjourned. <laughs>